Let's call the council meeting to order. Allie, could you please take roll? Councilmember Jane Brom? Here. Councilmember Bruce Bassett? Here. Councilmember Mike Cerro? Here. Councilmember Mike Grady? Here. Councilmember Dan Grouse? Here. Deputy Mayor L. Jenke? Here. Mayor Jim Pierman? Here, and uh, thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, tonight, we've got um, three regular agenda uh, agenda bills under regular business and one of them I have a feeling that a lot of people are here for and like to speak on and that is uh, number five which is a shoreline master program update and uh, what we'd appreciate is if you want to speak on that to we'll give you an opportunity when that agenda bill comes up and then we can keep it all tight together at that if that works for you and then at the beginning we'll open it up for appearances and if anyone would like to address the council on any other business and if you have to go and you want to address with the shoreline issue at the beginning feel free to do so so with that uh, we open up public appearances please come forward give your name address and you'll have three minutes uh, to address the council the lights up here if you haven't done it before uh, the green uh, will basically stay green until there's 30 seconds left at 30 seconds out the yellow goes on and then when red the three minutes is up and uh, if you need additional time uh, we do not go past three minutes uh, but if you have prepared remarks or anything that you want to share with us Allie our city clerk would be happy to have those uh, given to her so with that we'll open it up for public appearances would anyone like to address the City Council please good evening <clears throat> My name is David John. I'm a physician. <clears throat> I live at 8817 Southeast 61st Street. I'm a medical doctor <clears throat> who has worked for nine years on the faculty of the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry, where I published many papers in the field of biological chemistry. More details on my background are on the papers that I've given to each one of the council members. I am here tonight to make a request. The request is that you direct the Mercer Island Water Department to include the following warning with all water bills that they send out every two months. Quote, your public water supply has fluoride added. Avoid using this water for making infant formula or for babies 12 months of age or younger. Close quote. <clears throat> this is a restatement of the warning that has been issued to all dentists by the American Dental Association but it may not be known by all Mercer Island residents. I stop for one second. Did all of you know that? Just think. Did you or didn't you know that? Some people knew it. I bet you some people didn't know it. Anyway, um, the fluoride in the water that Mercer Islanders drink is, comes from toxic waste from cleaning the chimneys of phosphate fertilizer plants. It contains up to 150 different contaminants and is so dangerous that disposal in the ocean is illegal. Instead, it is dumped into our drinking water. The most obvious evidence of poisoning by fluoride is fluorosis. Fluorosis is modeling and discoloration of teeth, which is only caused by excessive fluoride. Dental fluorosis is a permanent record showing that fluoride has interfered with the basic life functions of the enamel-forming cells, the ameloblasts, causing them to produce damaged collagen. Then, when the calcium and phosphate are deposited on this damaged collagen framework to form teeth, the distortions in the resulting tooth enamel can be seen with the naked eye as the white, yellowish, or brownish spots and or streaks of the permanent condition called fluorosis. This is how fluoridated water contributes to the fluorosis that affects about 51% of children in areas of the United States that have fluoridated water. This is an outrage, in my opinion. Babies are especially vulnerable to fluoride because when adults kidneys, while adult kidneys can remove about half the fluoride that gets into the bodies, babies' kidneys being less developed are only able to excrete about 20%. Therefore, the babies have to store 80% of the poisonous fluoride they take in. Babies also drink about two and a half times or more as much water per pound of the body weight as adults. The combination of these factors makes babies much more vulnerable to developing fluoride toxicity rapidly. The council members should take immediate action to protect Mercer Island's most vulnerable and most defenseless citizens. 
I'll need you to wrap up your comments. Because sir. of these facts, I hope you will do what I said about Great. putting the note. Thank you for coming. And uh, Allie, do you have a copy? Okay. Thank you so much. Would anyone else like to address the city council? Hi, Mayor, uh, Deputy Mayor and Council. My name is Dave Douglas. I'm no stranger to uh, Mercer Island Planning Commission, City Council, or planning staff. And I don't need notes tonight because I just want to say thank you. I want to uh, say thank you to everybody that had anything to do with the Shoreline Master Program update that I have followed for over two years with the city. And uh, being that I've uh, been involved with 14 of them now, and I'm currently assisting Lake Stevens and uh, Yarrow Point and a few others, um, I want to tell you that you guys came through, in my opinion, in doing what everyone thought you would do, and that is representing the best interest of your property owners without compromising the environment. I realize it's a controversial issue, uh, and, and there's a lot of sensitive topics that go into it, but when all is said and done, I think you made a lot of wise decisions, uh, not only in your development standards, allowing nonconforming uh, uh, structures to stay and uh, be replaced in kind, but also because you are going to allow a, a caveat there that if it's approved by WDFW and the Army Corps of Engineers, that it'll be approved locally for the most part also. I think that is a very wise move. And you may not know it or not, but you guys are local heroes because everybody is watching what's going on in Mercer Island because we all know that ecology doesn't play fair. Um, they're not bad people. It's just they think differently than we do in most cases. But uh, being that I've been involved in a lot of these for several years now, I just really want to compliment you, your entire staff, clear from George, Travis, um, Mr. Stewart, and everybody else that had anything to do with your SMP update. And I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Robert Thorpe, 5800 West Mercer Way. Welcome back, Mr. Mayor. You're looking very good. And Thank glad you. Glad to see you back. Um, I, I, I think uh, I would agree with the previous speaker. I think a lot has happened, and I appreciate all the hard work. Um, I do think that uh, looking at the 700 property owners and the other three or 400 that have either easements or semi-private re uh, recreational tracks and the fact that there's only 30 or 40 undeveloped lots, there are some good decisions. I'd, I'd just like to leave you with the perspective that I got traveling to 10 countries in Europe, starting in Reykjavik, going to Amsterdam, to uh, Copenhagen, to all the major cities, and it was real interesting. I started watching, I was in Reykjavik catching coho salmon like this, and I asked them, and they said, well, wasn't this way 10 or 15 years ago, because it was polluted. And you all know the Baltic has a very narrow entrance near Copenhagen, and so it doesn't flush out much. You know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 80% of their salmon population was gone. What was causing it? Pollution primarily from the Iron Curtain countries, from Russia, from Poland, and Germany. Once they begin to clean that up, they're back to 70% of where they were before. So I talked to fishermen. I went down to a Viking museum and talked to guys who were building boats, dock builders, people fishing right in front of the palace in Copenhagen. I mean, you, they're catching big salmon like this right out by the tourists. It's incredible. And it's all back. But I talked to them and I asked them and I looked at the armory. And it's similar, you know, the armoring's laid back. It allows the wave to break up and with voids and pockets. So I took lots of pictures of that because <coughs> I, like the previous speaker, worked on maybe 12, 15 of these. But the one thing it became, I began to ask people. I said, well, you know, what's going on? I see all these 8, 10, 12, 20-foot 20, 20 docks, and I said, in the United States, we're talking about making them 4-foot docks. And they looked at me universally like I was totally out of my mind. And they said, there's no correlation. There's no correlation to the return of the fish and the size of docks. The yeah, other is to pollution. There is to runoff. There is to all these other things. So in saying that, you know, they just kept doing that. So I continued asking people that I met on the boat that were professors, that were biology professors and other thing and again and again they look at me like you Americans like over regulation so it was kind of funny and just as an aside they uh, they also comment on our on our being the policemen of the world they didn't think we should be doing that either so thank you for your time tonight <laughs> thanks Bob anyone else like to address the council well, are we talking now about the shoreline? You, you can hold if you want to wait until the actual agenda bill you'll have an opportunity to speak at that time if you want to speak now, you're welcome to, either or. But you get one. Well, you get one bite of the apple, so it's either now or later. Yeah. I have some written comments here. Uh, my name is Richard Ferry, and uh, my wife and I are the proud owners of a property down at 7414 East Mercer Way here on Mercer Island. And this is my second, possibly third trip to the podium uh, to discuss the Shoreline Master Plan. Uh, one or two with the 
Planning Commission, and I think one, I don't think I've been with the City Council yet. First, Maude and I want to thank the City Council, as David expressed his own views, for staying with the Planning Commission's belief and recommendations that the Shoreline Master Plan should not be more restrictive than the requirements of the state and federal government and should provide our residents with some flexibility when coordinating with any one of the numerous agencies regulating our shoreline use of the lake uh, here on Mercer Island. We are also very much impressed that the Council is staying within the legislative mandate described as no net loss, no net loss, using sound and reasonable analysis to balance the cost and benefits to islanders while at the same time meeting the minimum requirements from ecology. We have been told that a few council members uh, may have a different agenda calling for greater restrictions and regulatory control far exceeding what is required under the state and federal mandates. In our opinion, that would be detrimental to the Mercer Island property owners and to the economic future of our island. We believe that most of the Mercer Island residents would say that we are overburdened, overburdened with local, state, and federal regulations. To those council members, we offer the following thought. If you find yourself in conflict or debate, between your agenda and the interest of Mercer Island property owners, give the islanders the benefit of the doubt and approve the regulations as they were proposed by the Planning Commission. And please, please remember that you are, were elected to represent us. We again want to thank the Planning Commission for their dedicated work over the past 24 months on this critical process, along with the extraordinary efforts of the Mercer Island staff who have spent literally hundreds of hours to research and support the work of the Planning Commission and the City Council. Finally, we have one request to the Council, one request. If you decide to make any material changes tonight, please give the folks on Mercer Island time to understand and to respond before you adopt a revised uh, master plan. And in that regard, uh, I have some concern about the new language that's been added on pages 22 and uh, 23 and 24 of the Shoreline Master Plan. Our concern relates to the development standards for the replacement, repair, and maintenance of overwater structures. It deals with the 18-inch height requirement over the ordinary high water mark. And depending upon where you take the measurement, if you take the top of the dock or the bottom of the dock or the facial board, uh, I would suspect that if you take it at anything other than the top of the dock, three-quarters of the, of the, uh, of the uh, docks in Mercer Island would probably not meet the, the new standards that you've set for us. So I think it's important that you talk about this tonight and explore some of the options that you might have about that. I don't think you should be writing these regulations. I think you should let the state and federal agencies set these standards. And we thank you for these deliberations, and we look forward to hearing about your resolution when we finish tonight. Okay. Thank, you. thank you very much. Please. Staying on the same subject while we're on it, uh, my sure. name is Fred Weiss. I live at 3410 97th Avenue Southeast, and I've been there since 1975. Um, three quick comments, and I'm in support of what all these gentlemen before me have eloquently said. My comments will not be as erudite as Richard or the doctor, but however, one, I just would ask that you continue to protect the property rights of, of all Mercer Island citizens, and particularly the waterfront that pay two or three or four times on a per capita basis the taxes and I know you're already cognizant of the science and the questionable science of what sometimes the ecology people in the environmental movement is trying to to thrust upon us and thirdly and lastly I do wonder at how we've evolved from a uh, protection of the environment and a study of ecology to from conservation to almost preservation as if we would go back before there was any civilization or people living here. I know if you go back 300 years or 200 years, there was nobody here and it was entirely different. But I don't think anybody is suggesting we do that and I would hope that you would um, take that approach too. And I uh, give my um, comments also that uh, it appears that the Planning Commission has done a very fine job on researching the whole operation, and I would thank them for that. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address the council? 
Okay, we are going to still give you an opportunity if you're here for the shoreline uh, uh, master plan to have an opportunity to speak when we bring that agenda bill forward. So at this point, we're going to end uh, public appearances. We'll go into the consent calendar. We have two items. Do we have a motion to presume, pre <coughs> excuse me, approve the consent calendar? Motion to approve the consent calendar, Mr. Mayor. Okay, moved and seconded. Discussion? Mr. Mayor, I'd like yeah. to take uh, AB 4663 off. Okay, that'll turn into our first regular business. That leaves us pay, uh, payables and payroll. A quick question on that. Uh, what is stop payment confirmation? That's the first time I've seen that on your AP sheet. Um, I, I couldn't tell you today. I'd have to it, give you a call tomorrow. It's most likely a check that was stopped, stop payment on a check that was issued. And there's a fee related to that then? Yep. Okay, that's all I have. Okay, all those in favor of approving the consent calendar, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we'll move on then to regular business. We have Agenda Bill 4663 and uh, Council Member Cyril. Real quick comment here, Mr. Mayor. I'd just like to um, show my appreciation to the staff on thoroughly incorporating the PCI, the Pavement uh, Condition Index, in the analysis and the presentation of our residential street overlays. And I think that's a very analytical way to approach our uh, delegation of resources uh, to that uh, 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 priority of government, if you will. So having said that, I would like to move to award schedules A, B, and C of the 2011 Residential Street Overlays Project to Lakeside Industries in the amount of 433778 Set the total project budget to 518950 and direct the city manager to execute the construction contract. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thanks, Mr. Mike. Mr. Mayor, yes. I just wouldn't want this moment to go by without acknowledging our street engineer, Clint Morris, has just met the council member Mike Zero test. <laughs> 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 there you go, Clint. I think there's a dance, Clint. <laughs> okay, with that, let's go on to Agenda Bill 4651, Senior Advisory Board um, Establishment. There is no presentation, uh, but we have Cindy in the audience, do we, in case? Yeah, there you are. Do you want to? There is no presentation. You come forward, though. Okay, um, so with that, do we have a motion? Council, this is, this is simply... Uh, us following through with what you have already discussed and directed Cindy to uh, come forward with. So that's why there's no presentation, and we will take a motion unless you've got some questions. I'd like to point out an inconsistency. Um, I see the agenda bill um, noting that there, that the um, uh, the senior um, what's it called now? The advisory board. Senior advisory board would be composed of 11 members, but the actual ordinance says. Um, nine members. Yes. Yeah. So it is nine. It's nine. We 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 the the suggestion of nine or eleven was brought up by the the members who spoke before you. And when we wrote the agenda bill, we went with nine. And that was simply because since then we've had some transition, and it's hard to get that many. So we thought we'd at least go for nine. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dan, you're the liaison. Do you want to make a motion? <laughs> <laughs> long I forgot what it was like <laughs> um, I the uh, move to uh, suspend City Council rules of procedure 5.2 requiring a second reading of ordinances second. okay it's been moved and seconded any discussion mr. mayor yes you know I we go through this every time almost every time and I would ask that the council think seriously about not suspending uh, the City Council rules on this uh, agenda item just for the sake of giving our seniors the opportunity to let this percolate a, uh, in the community and maybe have some additional suggestions uh, to the council or uh, to Cindy and uh, and that opportunity will be given uh, through the time that not approving um, the suspension of the rules would give any other comments like what has been kicking around for the better part of seven months so and I think Cindy has gone out of her way to solicit input from the senior community, which is 
which underlies the drafting of the ordinance. So I, I mean, I, I generally, as, as a matter of general principle, I, I don't disagree with your philosophy on this, but this is not something which I think anyone's going to come out of the woodwork in the next two weeks and say, why didn't you listen to us and why didn't you solicit our opinion? And if they do, Mike, I'll be the first one to to support a motion which asks for reconsideration of this thing. Well, uh, we're in no, I don't think we're in a hurry to get this going. And this is in an, another forum, yet another forum, to publicize this to the seniors in the community. Any other it, comments? Well, just yeah, if, I, if I could, uh, Cindy, I'm, I'm just curious whether you have felt there was controversy surrounding this issue uh, as you were constructing this. Are, are there some folks? I mean, we're not hearing from anybody tonight. I've heard mm -hmm. no comments, public comments uh, at all about this issue. But are you um, thinking there, there might be folks who pop up after, between now and another meeting on this that, that might have uh, further input that would uh, redirect our opinions? Not that I can see. I think a lot of people have weighed in on this, so I realize it's a matter of procedure, but I don't think there's any other, uh, any controversy about this. Yeah. Any other comments? Um, I, I guess I'd just question, um, uh, unlike other boards and commissions, this one looks like to be, to be set up to recommend to the Parks and Rec and to Youth and Family Services, but not directly to the council. Correct. Other boards and commissions report directly to the council that's correct and that it actually that's the change it's to and the number and the age of right but the the, citizens. the previous senior commission um, was reporting to the council and it, it had some structural problems there, there were just issues and ultimately what the council at its planning session prior to your coming to the council concluded that as an advisory body on the services that parks and rec and youth and family services provide an advisory body to those d department directors and those departments was probably the most effective way to get input and make change. So, but we, we sort still of have a liaison. Exactly. Yeah. So we sort of decoupled it from the council and got it more directed to the, to the departments. Any other comments? Okay, we have a motion. It's been seconded. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Okay, moving on. Mr. Mayor, I would move to adopt ordinance number 11C-10, establishing a senior advisory board. Do you have a second? Okay, we've got three at once. I think great, Mr. Grady. Council Member Grady got that in there. Okay, any discussion? He gets the second. You were just louder, but he was there. some seniority here. I would gladly defer to the senior. Okay, you get it. So, Allie, L seconded. All right. With that, any discussion? Yeah, Bruce? I guess I'm looking for some help with understanding uh, Article 5, okay. which is amendments. And my initial read of this, I haven't had time to ask anybody about this coming in, but my initial read of it is that we, uh, this is um, right. perhaps in a, pro I'm not sorry, I'm on page 12 of the bill. Okay. Exhibit 3. Those are the bylaws. bylaws. Yes. Right, and the, the thing that's bothersome to me is that it appears that the advisory board has the authority to change its bylaws, but which would put its bylaws into conflict with the ordinance by so doing. And is that, am I miss? It's, it's not uncommon for our boards, any of our boards of commission, to have their own bylaws. Uh, they can't adopt things that are in conflict with the underlying ordinance that creates them. So. I mean, that is a, always a governing um, piece, and the city attorney's office would be the ones to re review that. But it is not uncommon for them to set their own bylaws, and often it's about, you know, the just the basic running of meetings and where and when they meet and sort of the mechanics. But we built some of that into the ordinance and then seem to give them the authority to, ch to change it. So I feel uh, like we're sort of setting ourselves up for a uh, conflict when they read this and say, okay, well, I'd, I'd like to change my rules. They, they can't change the bylaws to be inconsistent with the ordinance. It doesn't, could, it doesn't say that. It says, they can change, it says they can change anything in these bylaws, I believe. Right, but that's, yeah. the, I mean, that's the by. Are we actually, a, are we adopting the bylaws tonight? 
No, no. You're, you're only just adopting draft the bylaws ordinance. for, the, for the Yeah, first. we're just doing the ordinance. The bylaws, okay. I think, are just, this is just a draft for our, for our information. Right. So they're going to adopt their own bylaws anyway. And uh, it, it is a good point, and maybe Cindy can make sure that when these bylaws get to the Senior Advisory Board for their we own like approval, that. that it reflects the fact that they can't adopt anything that's in conflict with the ordinance. And I'm fine with that. I, and I have no problem with the with the ordinance. I just saw the potential for conflict. That, that's down a great the road. point. We'll include that. Okay. Yeah. Hey, any more discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Great. Thanks, Cindy. Appreciate it. We're going to go on now to uh, Agenda Bill 4662, Single Family Residential Impervious Service. This is our second reading. And Tim, uh, do you have a presentation? July uh, 18th meeting, Council asked us to do two things. First was to uh, improve the grammatical structure of the amendment, and the second one was to consider the relationship uh, between this amendment, impervious surface, um, and um, overwater structures. Uh, we've included new grammatical language, which we agree is a great improvement over the previous language that had been considered. Um, and also uh, explained um, the relationship between impervious surface and overwater structures, and we do not recommend at this time that you um, you make any changes to those regulations. Further explanation in the agenda bill, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Tim. Any questions for staff? Seeing none, thank you. Um, do we have a motion then from the floor? I move Council. to adopt an ordinance 11C-08 as presented in Exhibit 1 to Agenda Bill 4662, amending Mercer Island City Code 1901.050F1. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Discussion? I read the earlier version and it was a, uh, it was definitely looking like a brain teaser to me and the new version I like it <laughs> seemed very clear so thank you <laughs> okay anyone else yes I, I, I will commend development services in their in their use of grammar for this ordinance with the great assistance of the law department yes <laughs> okay yeah, all right they, anything yeah, else counsel, I hope. okay <laughs> seeing none all those in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed great thanks Tim appreciate it Okay, we are now moving on to um, the Agenda Bill 4661, the Shoreline Master uh, Program Update. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we are opening it up for public comment at this time, and then we will bring it back to staff. If anyone would like to speak on this who has not spoken before, please come forward and uh, address the council. My name is Esther Barsher, and we're waterfront owners, 6940 96th Avenue Southeast. And uh, I wanted to say I really appreciate the time and effort that the Planning Commission took to make the recommendations for the Shoreline Management Act. And I do hope that this council will really consider following the recommendations. And my comment is that a four-foot dock for the first 30 feet is a very narrow space. I have real concerns about health, about safety issues, especially when you have water on both sides. And when the water level is high, like it has been this year, believe me, it's very slippery and there's not very much room. So that, they are my concerns. So I think that uh, I hope that you'll really consider uh, given us as much space as we can and still be able to uh, follow the Shoreline Management Act. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address the council? Uh, Robert Harper, 4651 Forest Avenue. And uh, I'm privileged that to note that you've got my doc in your picture here. <laughs> Was that a setup? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wonder. <laughs> uh, the, the one that's at the angle there is the, is the one on the, just to the right of that. But it's a few years old. My neighbors added a few things since then. But um, you started my time on it? 
Yeah, we'll give you fresh time. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I just have some general comments. Uh, two years ago, I wanted to take out uh, my bulkhead and uh, create a beach, uh, something I believe is desired in terms of protecting the shoreline and the lake in general. Uh, so I had plans to drop. I had plans drawn up by an, an architect. Uh, the plans included removal of the bulkhead, replacing my lawn with more native uh, plants. But when I inquired upon what kind of permits I needed, I was informed I needed a permit from the Army Corps of Engineers. I needed a permit from the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and I needed a permit from the uh, City of Mercer Island. To get these permits, it, it was suggested that I hire a a consultant at about $200 an hour to provide the environmental impact study and also guide me through the through the maze. So uh, I canceled the project. Uh, so I still have my bulkhead is depicted there and uh, my lawn. Uh, pr probably a good decision. My neighbor decided to replace his cabana with a larger structure after spending $28,000 on studies, consultants, engineers, architects, arborists. Uh, he finally gave up. He just, every time he thought he jumped through all the hoops, something else was added. Uh, he ended up just remodeling his existing cabana, uh, no permits. <clears throat> These type of regulations create a lose-lose situation in, in, from my perspective. The homeowners are unhappy because they can't do what they want without a, additional expenses and a lot of hassle. Uh, the city and the Department of uh, Fish and Wildlife lose because they don't get the homeowners to pay for these uh, um, improvements that, that they actually want uh, and the people are who are going to do the work uh, lose because they don't get the jobs and I think that's really critical in our uh, trying to get our economic uh, environment to recover here uh, and now I understand the city is trying to pass even more stricter regulations than required all involved uh, revolving around the idea that uh, shadows create a haven for predatory fish at least that's my understanding I think the City Council really faces a big challenge of uh, losing public confidence over this issue. Uh, for instance, I can tie my 40-foot boat to the dock, if I had a 40-foot boat, um, and uh, it's going to create a big shadow. I don't need a permit. But if I want to put on a lift, if I want to lift my 18-foot boat up and put a cover over it, I've got to have a permit. Uh, I can drag my floating trampoline out, uh, tie it to the dock, gigantic shadow, no permits required. Uh, and if you live on the west side, like I do in the morning, the trees actually cause the biggest shadow. But the trees next to the water are uh, good uh, as long as they are native. But you better not try to put your Japanese maple next to the, to the water because that's a no-no. So I'm not suggesting that we increase regulation to cover tying your boat to the dock or putting on your trampoline, but uh, just to point out the inconsistencies. Right. And, and by the way, for 15 years I've uh, watched the bass fishermen go by and fish underneath my dock for uh, to try and catch fish in my neighbor's docks. I've never seen them catch anything, not even a bite. So uh, I don't know about predatory fish hanging out in the shadows. I'll, I'll need you to, to wrap your comments up. Okay. We, we gave you I got extra time that I ate up at the beginning. Three sentences here. Yeah. So it seems to me like the job of the city council is to create, is to help citizens and create win-win situations, uh, not hassle them based on questionable regulations and uh, questionable science. So the suggestion uh, is to, from my perspective, is to make it as easy as possible to people for people to actually get done what you want to have done. Great. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you so much. Time. Yeah. Would anyone else like to address the council? Good evening. My name is Jack Hanover. I'm a resident 6460 East Mercer. I apologize. I'm a little late getting here, but I did write the speeches for Richard and Fred, so I feel my, my point of view is... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I want to be, be very brief, but I, I just was in a conversation today with an old Mercer Island native, Luke Capsandy, who some of you probably know well, and we had a conversation today, and I was telling him that I was going to the meeting tonight, and he said, be sure to mention some of the things that I said several years ago when the meandering line was being drawn around the island. And I think most of you realize that, that he was uh, from Hungary and his idea of property rights differed from a lot of other people's, but he wanted to make sure that uh, we remembered his speech about how important it was that individual rights are, are uh, respected. Thank you. Thank you.
Good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, Council Members. My name is Randy Banneker. I'm here on behalf of the Seattle King County Association of Realtors, uh, 12410 Southeast 32nd Street in Bellevue. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm here to thank you also for your work on the Shoreline Master Program and encourage your support of the resolution before you tonight and the draft ordinance that the Planning Commission has uh, prepared for you. Realtors seek to ensure that the traditional and, and reasonable residential uses within, shore, within the shoreline zone are allowed to continue. And we seek a balance of environmental protection uh, with a person's right to peacefully enjoy their property. We believe you've struck that balance in this ordinance. You've established a no net loss of ecological function You've provided for repair, replacement of overwater structures, including docks, within a specific set of conditions to ensure continued safe water access and enjoyment. You've provided for hard and soft shoreline stabilization to keep erosion in check, and you've established re reasonable uh, vegetation requirements to balance nearshore habit habitat with human access to water and recreation that goes along with it. This is a strong and balanced package and urge your support. Thank you. Th thank you. Would anyone else like to come forward? Mayor, Ms. I'm Bob Rowe from 7620 East Mercer Way. I've lived on the island a few years now. And I've been to different meetings over the past years on all the regulations that go way back into the 60s. And as far as I'm concerned, the property rights need to be protected. And what the uh, master plan shows, I, I believe, does that. And we don't need to put more regulations on the people that pay the taxes and pay everybody's wages here. And uh, we, need, we need to strike a good balance there. So I basically uh, thank the council and the planning commission for putting a package together. I know these things are difficult. Emotions run high, but uh, don't put any more regulations on what we already have. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to come forward? Last call. Yep. My name is Dwight Schaefer. I live at 6958 96th Avenue Southeast. Uh, there was a very interesting and lengthy front page article in the Times yesterday regarding water pollution. Apparently $1.3 billion in King County and Seattle taxpayer funds is planned to reduce sewer discharges caused by storms. Uh, Bill Ruckelshaus, the two-time EPA chief, says this source of pollution doesn't even make the top 20 anymore. The number one source is surface runoff, which isn't even addressed, and which has been estimated to cost 3 to $16 billion to fix. King County government has declined to readdress priorities. Ruckelshaus urges cost-benefit analysis in getting the best return for the taxpayer dollars. Now, Mercer Island has a similar a different situation. Some water discharge is recognized as the number one problem for water pollution, at least by the last meeting, but it doesn't make the top 10 in terms of priorities listed in Exhibit 5. Overwater coverage, however, is number three and native vegetation is number seven, but both have been said to have negligible effect by the expert witnesses, which includes NOAA and the Department of Fisheries. The Mercer Island wasted resources isn't $1.3 billion or even a super sizable amount, but instead it's the waste of two years of volunteer time donated by a very talented planning commission and their expert witnesses. They have been a group with impressive intellectual credentials. However, the city council, many of whom haven't attended the planning commission meetings, has dismissed the Planning Commission's well-conceived recommendations without justification and ignored the comments, letters, and emails from their constituents without justification. As a consequence, I doubt that this type of talented resource will be available when the more important and complex issue of storm runoff needs to be addressed and all the associated metals that are causing uh, fish problems. 
Please reconsider the wisdom of your decision to override the Planning Commission recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to come forward? My name is Glenn Burns. I live on 5034 Butterworth Road on the island. Uh, I've lived there since the 60s. And uh, I want to echo what a lot of the other people have, have mentioned ahead of me. And I feel that Mercer Island doesn't have any business trying to oppose additional regulations to those already imposed by the state of Washington and the Army Corps of Engineers. And uh, I think that the studies done by the Department of Ecology have a lot of weak areas and a lot of suppositions. And uh, I, you know, for example, the uh, you know the shade issue that's been mentioned, where you know the shade by docks is bad, but the shade from trees is good. You know, and I just find that trying to make decisions based on this kind of weak study and and uh, make your decisions based on this weak study and then impose hardship on the uh, waterfront owners is wrong and and I think that uh, this has been mentioned several times but it's been you know but it's been largely ignored and and I feel that you should protect the residents of Mercer Island and uh, and look at the inconsistencies in that study and I also wanted to mention that as was mentioned before that you know Mercer Island is not a pristine mountain lake that doesn't have any people or any water traffic. And that you have, with the boat traffic that we have now, on weekends, you have two to three foot waves hitting the shoreline all the time. And I think removing a bulkhead in the face of that, it just strikes me as silly. And, I, and so I, I just wanted to ask you to protect the rights of the property owners. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, seeing none, we will, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Poll number, huh? <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Rob Hagedorn, and I live at uh, 7452 East Mercer Way. And uh, my, uh, I'm in the plant food business, miracle Grow plant food, and that's my family business. And we started out in New York, and we watched the with dismay, really, the quality of Long Island Sound. Um, it was uh, these red, these tidal blooms of algae. And because it's a family business, and we're also, we were very avid boaters, we were really concerned as a family, is this something that we are, we're creating? And a lot of people were blaming fertilizers for the problem. Now, one of the things I noticed as a water skier was that there was, a lot of pollution in the water that was clearly human produced, if you know what I mean. And when Bridgeport, Connecticut finally installed their new water treatment plant, all the algae blooms disappeared. And I just want to point that out. The, I also learned though in the process of studying the um, water pollution and is that the runoff created by construction, like anywhere and you have soil that would run into the water in a rainstorm or a bulkhead's removed and the soil moves in, that soil is loaded with nutrients. It has to be because you have all those trees and plants that just grow naturally there. And <clears throat> that can really affect water quality. And when you add all those nutrients, uh, if you have a problem like, uh, what's that called, um, water foil? Milfoil. Milfoil. Now that thing is like a, a blight. I've watched in dismay as that has moved across my dock and it has just smothered all the life out of the area around my dock. I can't swim in it, but even worse, it's impossible for a fish to move in there and then it, when it dies seasonally, it decomposes and sucks up all the oxygen as it decomposes. And when I tried to hire a company to remove that, they said, well, we're going to have to get an EPA study, and that was somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 grand. So that kind of put the brakes 
And I probably should just stop being a cheapskate and go ahead and do it. But in any event, I think you're doing a great job preserving the quality of life um, for all the residents of Mercer Island. And I know that's what you're interested in doing. And you want to be good stewards. And I think you're doing a great job. Um, I would be a little bit hesitant about adding lots of regs, because you can always add them later. You can, but pulling them back is almost impossible. Anyway, thank you. Great. Thank you. I'm Mark Vanderwall. I live at 8101 Southeast 70th Street. I've been an island resident most of my life. Grew up on Holly Hill Drive on the water. Uh, my father still lives there. He was going to come to this meeting, but he's 88 years old and getting around isn't as easy as it could be. Uh, a couple concerns I have. One is the width of the dock. The talk about a four-foot width dock. For my father, it would be next to him. You know, really difficult with a walker to get out on the dock with a, a narrow dock like that with assistance. And my other concern is the talk about the 30-foot the uh, distance. Uh, it should be based on the depth because some parts of the island, 30 feet, it's still three feet deep. In other places, you're at 15 feet deep. And so, you know, you need a, a, enough dock for a boat to tie up to it. And besides that, I've got nothing. Thank you. Great. Good to see you, Mark. 78, wasn't it? Mr. Mayor, I'd like to point out that, <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I'd like to point out that yeah. that's Mayor Vanderwall. Mayor? Mayor Vanderwall. Really? From Roche Harbor, Mayor of Roche Harbor there. Are you really now? That's great. And uh, graduated with my sister. Anyway, with that, uh, anyone else like to come forward? Okay, we'll close the uh, public appearances. And uh, Tim, uh, you'll have the floor. Great. Tim Stewart, uh, Director of the Development Services Group. Um, the uh, action before you this evening is uh, Resolution 1440. It authorizes, um, expresses the Council's intent to adopt an update of the Shoreline Master Program and authorizes the submittal to the Washington State Department, uh, Department of Ecology. Uh, process to date, you've heard a lot about it. Planning Commission, 29 meetings, two public hearings, thousands of pages of documents, hundreds of spoken and written comments. Council has now undertaken five meetings. Public testimony has been accepted at each meeting. Hundreds of pages of spoken and written comments. Um, Council has uh, uh, basically uh, accepted most of the Planning Commission recommendations uh, with four, uh, four changes. And I briefly like to go through those changes this evening. The first one is dock width. Second one is the location of covered moorages within the first, first 30 feet of the ordinary high water mark. Uh, third one is the new standards for major replacement and repair of existing overwater structures. And the fourth is dredging exception for fish spawning areas. Dock width, the Planning Commission's recommendation, and this is for new docks only. This would not affect a repair or reconstruction of an existing dock. Uh, Planning Commission recommended for new docks that the maximum width be eight feet. Uh, as you know, Ecology had recommended four feet in the first 30 feet and six feet thereafter. City Council uh, suggested that new docks be a maximum of four feet within the first 30 feet uh, from the ordinary high water mark and eight feet thereafter. Covered moorages, um, this was a topic that was discussed at the last meeting and there was a bit of confusion. Um, one section of the ordinance states that only piers, ramps, and lift stations may be within the first 30 feet of the ordinary high water mark um, and was subject to alternative design standards. The question came, what would new covered moorages, how would new covered moorages fit uh, in this section? And the clarification is that covered moorages would also be excluded from within the 30 feet. Again, new covered moorages within the first 33 feet and would be subject to the alternative design standards. Um, major replacement repair of existing overwater structures. This would be uh, not affecting new or minor repairs, less than 50%. Planning Commission deferred the standards to the federal and state governments. Council added new standards when replacement or repair exceeded 50%. Uh, in dredging and fish spawning areas, the PC recommended uh, continued 
the current standard that all dredge dredging be prohibited in fish spawning areas. Council, after listening to testimony, provided for an exception when the fish habitat would be significantly improved by the project. So the next steps, um, uh, I want to emphasize that this is not the adoption of the ordinance. This is only an adoption of the resolution to forward it to ecology. Um, staff following um, council action would be prepare a very large formal submittal to ecology. Uh, typically then there'd be discussions between the city and ecology staff. Ecology would issue a formal uh, response to the city's submittal. Uh, at that point, city staff would return to the council for future direction and deliberations. Uh, and at some point, the city would make a decision and then submit a final action to ecology. Then you would have a formal decision by ecology, and only then would the SMP take effect. So with that uh, brief summary, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great. Thanks, Tim. Council? Yeah. Um, Tim, on page 24 of the agenda bill where you've added the part about um, the more than 50% requirements. You look at that. And by the way, that picture looks nothing like me. <laughs> <laughs> it has much more hair than I do. <laughs> uh, page. <laughs> past life, perhaps? Ah, uh, past life. <laughs> uh, page 24, uh, where are we? On um, where you added the text at the top of the page. Exhibit 2, page 24. Number 5. Yes. I'm with you. Um, I was just curious, on, on paragraph C and D, which talk about the chemicals that can be used, um, is there any reason why that shouldn't apply no matter what percentage change is being made? I mean, it, it, would, would anyone, would anyone on staff ever suggest that that any of these chemicals be used even for a single piling? Well, I think the uh, Planning Commission's uh, thought on that was that that would be the responsibility of the federal and state governments no, I, I, in issuing the permits. Right, but I'm, I'm just asking from your, from the standpoint as, as Development Services Director as, as to what you, would, uh, what you would think from a construction standpoint, is, is there any question in your mind that, that this, that, you know, it, it, if the federal government, the state government, was to miss that one, would, would, is there any question in your mind that we would we should not be allowing that? Well, I really think it's a, a moot question because the federal and state governments do regulate these and do prohibit them. And the question is whether we would uh, want to impose our own separate standards that may be different from the federal and state governments. Okay, well, I'm, you, you, you avoid my question. I'm trying to ask you from a professional standpoint, looking at our code requirements, whether staff believes that these types of chemicals should be put into the lake. Well, the important thing is to uh, make sure that they aren't. And the question is, do we have sufficient federal and state regulations to, uh, to address that? And from my uh, working with the federal and state agencies, um, I've, my comfort level is very high that they would be, that these standards would be met or similar standards would be met um, and that if uh, there's enforcement actions to be taken, federal and state agencies are very aggressive in terms of taking those actions. Tim, I, another way I think Dan's asking the question is if the council were to decide to have an independent ban on those chemicals, would staff support that? Sure. Thank you. Other questions? Mike? Mike, Mike? I have, <laughs> I have some questions, uh, Mr. Mayor. Let me get back to my... Uh, Director, can you clarify on uh, page 23, Exhibit 1? What page? That's page 23, Exhibit, I'm sorry, Exhibit 2, page 23, Exhibit 2. Uh, 
uh, and that would be B triple I. The height of any structure is not increased but may be decreased. Now let's skip that one. Let's, let's go to the next one. A net gain in ecological function. Why, why did we use that standard, a net gain in ecological function, when that's not the standard? The standard is no net loss. Um, this provi particular provision, uh, item four, uh, is in regard to a uh, any structural change um, that is the applicant demonstrates to the director's satisfaction that the proposed change in location. This is focused in on the location, so that if you had a if you had a dock that was pressing up against a neighbor's property and uh, it was existing, then that location could be changed. And the standard to meet that would be the net gain in ecological function and a higher degree of conformity with the standards of the new overwater structure. So the discussion, um, uh, as I recall it, was that we, we wanted to uh, allow for some flexibility for the movement of a structure to increase uh, uh, setbacks or lack of uh, nonconformity. Uh, but if, they, if that were to happen, there would be those two criteria that would have to be met. Right, and I don't understand, and I don't recall why we said a net gain in ecological function when the standard that we've been talking about and that you've briefed us on is that it's no net loss. So a net gain in ecological function, worthy, but it, it exceeds that of which the standard of what we are supposed to base our new SMP on, right? Yeah, the net gain would be measured against the existing condition of the current facility. And if you're changing the location, then there would be a net gain required to be shown. And that understand, could be understand shown fully. in any it, number of different ways. Understand fully. But again, why that standard? Shouldn't the standard be no net loss to be consistent with the directive from the legislature? The... Um, no, not well, let me, let me, let me, director. Let me ask the question differently. Are we ratcheting up the regulation from what the standard is, no net loss, by putting a net gain in ecological function as the standard for changing an existing structure? The, Are um, we ratcheting up the, the regulation? Well, that's a pretty complex question. Let me try, um, try, try it this way. Um, the no net loss standard, the no net loss standard is not um, on one project or one program or one activity. The no net loss standard, the Department of Ecology director must approve that the city's SMP as a whole over a 20 year period meets the standard of no net loss. And in reviewing the program, each of these programs and activities and regulations will be looked at in terms of, does this activity create a net loss in ecological function? Is it neutral in ecological function? Or does it present some net gain? And in this standard, the standard that was chosen is some net gain in ecological function. So in the big balance sheet, the big scorecard in Olympia, this activity would be ranked as a net gain activity as opposed to a neutral or a loss activity. Was that a, was that the planning commission's recommendation or was that a change? I, I don't recall whether that was a change that we initiated at the council. Yeah, everything uh, that's highlighted was a change. I think this goes, uh, this was in the first meeting of the first action meeting by the council when we added the um, standards. That's to say the council ratcheted it up from what the Planning Commission recommended? I think this this was an addition uh, by the council. Okay. And then the next page. I'm a little, I'm uncomfortable and, and the next page is, is um, page 24, Exhibit 2. I, I've looked at this 50 percent repairing and replacing 50 percent of a of the structure and, and when we first adopted it, I was 
although I disagreed with it, I was I, I understood it as a compromise, and and that is the nature of this business up here. But then I started thinking about it, and it actually isn't a compromise. It's a very uh, well, it's not a compromise. Meaning, fifty percent of one's dock does not deteriorate faster or slower necessarily than the rest of it. So if somebody makes a decision to replace 50% of their dock or to need to replace 51% of their dock, they're really going to have to replace all of their dock. Or if they, follow me on that? Um, yes, I, you know, in theory I think that that's probably uh, correct that, you know, if you have a dock and it's all falling apart, um, you're going to replace It's all going to fall apart it's all together. Gonna, fall apart the, uh, together most of the time. Now there will be times when you will have a dock for whatever reason that's deteriorating at different rates. It may have been that there was a big repair replacement job 10 years ago that didn't do the whole thing or there are a lot of individual and unique circumstances out there and in tagging what uh, what threshold, the 50% number is the one that um, council concluded would and be where we would land. Okay, and that's uh, that's another ratcheting up that the council ratcheted up from the Planning Commission. Is that that's right? Uh, I wouldn't call it a ratcheting up. I would, I would uh, characterize it as a, a clarification expansion. But what I see from that is that, here again, a dog degrades consistently through the, the length of the dock that if you need to re replace 20 percent or 30 percent in all likelihood you're going to have to you're going to have the same degradation from the zero point to the hundred foot point on that dock and you're going to have to replace it all I think theoretically again that may be true but I, I know that there are going to be a lot of special circumstances out there that um, will be uh, less than the 50. I know that people will take that 50% into account when they make their plans. Uh, and it may be that, uh, you know, they, um, uh, they do want to replace the whole thing. If they're having to replace 60%, then, then they should have to meet some higher standards that, that um, uh, echo and replicate some of the standards that are imposed by the federal and state governments. Okay, and if we replace 51%, if we want to replace 51% of the dock, uh, then that means that it's, we have to completely replace the dock. If, if we want to repair 51% as the crow flies, as we see looking down on the yeah. dock, if we want to re repair 51% of the planks, planking, then in practice, We've got to replace the whole dock. Um, then you would need exist to to the new higher. Then then you would need standards. to meet the standards that are outlined below. So there are uh, five or six um, standards that would have to be met if you exceeded the fifty percent threshold. Okay, and then another question is on B there. Just clarification on what the minimum one point five foot height and maximum five foot height. Where, from where is that? Yeah, that's above the ordinary high water mark. So that would be from the high water mark to the first structure. To, to the first part of right. the fascia or? Right, whatever or, the or structure, structure is. Okay. So Tim, that, that was a question I had too, and from where is it measured? And it's from the ordinary high water mark to the underside of the deck. Right. So you have a foot and a half, a minimum of foot and a half clearance between the water and the underside. That's correct. Not the underside of the deck. That's not what he's saying. Well, underside the of the structure. Or, or the fascia. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, the underside of the structure. Until you hit a structure. Yeah. And that, when you change, if you replace your dock and you change it from, let's say it's six inches above OHW to 1.5 feet, and let's say you have a structure above that, does that mean that, and, and you're replacing the structure, does that mean you have to bring the structure down a corresponding amount? The, the top of the structure, or can you replicate the height of the structure from the dock height to the top of the structure? Yeah, I think the height limits are established in um, another part of the code. I could go look for those if you'd like. One of the um, one of the important provisions that um, is very important is that these are the standards for 50 percent or more, but there is always the alternative development standard. If you had a unique situation, something that didn't make sense to do in terms of meeting those criteria, 
you could apply to the Army Corps and Fed, uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife under the very next section down there on page 24 as an alternative development standard to do something other than the hard standard of the city. Oh, and, that, and that would be recognized by the city staff? That That's correct. Okay. And when I say that recognized, meaning if it was approved by COE or Fish and Wildlife, then you would also approve it? There are, and there's a, a second standard, and that is to demonstrate no net loss. And typically that is done through the core permitting process, the no net loss. Is that so no net loss system-wide through the island? or No, or on the pro this is on a project-specific basis uh, for in this particular case. Okay. And thank you, Tim. One last question I think if the council will allow is I had question on the dredging part, fish spawning areas, uh, except when the applicant conclusively demonstrated that the fish habitat will be significantly improved as a result of, of, the, pro uh, of the project. Uh, what is conclusively demonstrates versus again going back to no net loss? Well, the case that uh, was brought to council's attention was a case where an owner wanted to do dredging, and the area of dredging was in the fish was in a mapped fish spawning area, and the applicant's restoration proposal for that project would have uh, significantly improved fish habitat following the project. Um, evidence was submitted by the um, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife supporting that concept as being overall good for, for fish habitat. And so the council uh, provided that, that exception uh, to the prohibition of all dredging in fish spawning areas. But the conclusively, conclusively demonstrates how do you conclusively demonstrate in this business when we've had so much talk about what studies do or do not mean or how um, uh, and how applicable studies are to this area versus another area? Is it, pos is it going to be possible to conclusively, is it going to be possible for a consultant hired by one of our citizens to conclusively demonstrate anything? Typically, that would um, that would come through um, one of the resource agencies, federal state agencies, that reviews the proposal and agrees uh, that the uh, project as proposed would be an improvement. Now, the conclusion, conclusionary, or con uh, conclusively demonstrates uh, would be on the whole record. If there were uh, other evidence entered into the record that cast doubt on whether that would be an improved habitat, that would have to be taken into consideration. Uh, but if uh, the record indicated that um, all of the fish biologists who had looked at it um, all s stood up and said, yeah, this is a good thing for the habitat, to me that would be a, a conclusive demonstration of positive impact. Okay. One last question, Mr. Mayor, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. And this is on this is on um, the resolution itself, and that's on PDF 67 or Exhibit 1, page 3. Um, on a, let's see, the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, whereas down, a shoreline analysis report. And the question I have is, <coughs> With the exception of shorelines at Luther Burbank, let's see, let me read the whole thing. Shoreline analysis conducted by qualified professionals has concluded that all of Mercer Island's shorelines, with the exception of the shorelines at Luther Burbank Park, have low ecological functions. Does that mean that, that is that the same thing as saying that they're hardened? All of our shoreline except for basically Luther Burbank is hardened? No. What it means is that uh, it has low ecological functions, that in comparison to uh, ecological functions of shorelines around the state, uh, the great majority on Mercer Island have been categorized as low ecological functions. And that uh, is very important when we think about uh, how these shorelines are going to uh, evolve over time and how they may be improved over time uh, to improve that low quality. 
are the majority of shorelines around Lake Washington then uh, hardened with bulkheads? Are we at that point? <clears throat> I haven't uh, looked at the shoreline analysis reports from the other communities around uh, Lake Washington. I mean, but anecdotally, I would say yes. Uh, I haven't looked at the other reports. Okay, fair enough. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Okay, anyone else? This idea, Dan? Sorry, just the, the maybe it's for Katie Moore, a drafting question. On, um, on page 7, the uh, paragraph B1, which was the provision that's been in the Planning Commission <laughs> recommendation, that's the one on renovations, um, replacements. Given the additional text on page 23 and 24, does that need to be referenced now in B1 to make that consistent? Because that was before that that was yeah. everything was tied up in B1 before, but that never got changed, even though you added the text on 23 and 24. Yeah, I think the general rule of the more specific regulation would govern. So what we've got here is a general guidance regulation, and then we have a more specific regulation further in the um, further in the ordinance. I'm just the general rule. My understanding is that the more specific re regulation prevails. I, I I'm just asking Katie whether that's I. I'm, not what's wondering whether that should be cleaned up if we're going to go forward with this. I mean, just make it subject to whatever's in the later section. That's what you do else generally. Wait, why don't you give me a couple seconds and I'll look it back and forth and I'll come back. That's okay. okay. She's doing that. Anything else, Jane? <clears throat> uh, yeah, I have a question about um, the uh, replacement um, using the 50 percent measure for replacing or repairing docks. Mm -hmm. um, I would not want to get any more regulatory than, than what this says, but I have a problem with um, just stating if more than 50% of the structure's exterior surface, including decking or structural elements pilings, are replaced or constructed, um, that it must comply with the new standards. But um, on an old dock, you can replace virtually all of the decking without um, dealing at all with the stringers or the pilings. And that would seem to me be a lot less invasive and destructive of fish habitat than taking up pilings and messing with the stringers. So it, it seems like 50% of that is should not be um, the standard, but perhaps 50% of the whole structure rather than... Uh, Jane, let me kind of piggyback on your question because... Um, I conclude, or I thought, the 50% mean 50% of the total structure, not just decking or the stringers or piling, number of pilings or something like that. Um, and is that correct, Tim? Um, I mean, it, it's, it's tough to rigorously define what 50% is uh, unless you take the, the landward half or the waterward half and say one or the other, but in the aggregate, because um, you have all those individual elements and if you for instance as Jane's example suggests mm -hmm. if you just did the decking that is likely to be less than 50 percent because uh, on a cost basis certainly mm -hmm. oh, yeah. and on a, on a physical basis uh, logically too yeah well the way that the words um, read to me on on five uh, is that it is or 50 percent of the decking or 50 percent of the filing pilings uh, are replaced or reconstructed uh, for good, bad, or ugly. That's what it looks like to me. Um, so I, I guess related to that also, it's, uh, related to that also, I uh, was wondering what exterior surface beyond decking means. I mean, the, the exterior surface is decking, but what else is it? It could be uh, posts. It could be the frame of the structure. Uh, I would read that to mean 50% of the surface, so you basically look at it in plan, plan view like you're a crow flying over the top. And if there's 50% or more of the surface that is being changed, then it would trigger it. Okay, so uh, to clarify it then, what you mean by exterior surface is the decking? 
It, well, it could have other pieces as well. It could be decking. Stringers. I mean, that, that's the structure. That, yeah. That's where whatever is showing up on the surface, it would be the decking. What, it, what yeah. else is there? So, so if you had, if you had, um, I've seen seen some decks where there's major structural elements that hold it up, and then there's the decking that's in between those structural elements. The 50% would, in my judgment, be the whole surface. So if you could demonstrate that you were only replacing 40% of the surface because you're keeping those other structural elements and not changing it, then you'd be under the 50%. That's how I'm reading it. Tim, I, I would think if you imagined a box, exterior surface would be sides and top. And in the same respects here, exterior surface would be fascia as well as decking. Uh, one could look at it that way. It's just okay, Jane. Do you have any more questions? You got no. Okay, Thank Mike. Thank Bruce. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Tim, can you pull up those slides sure. from the lake line, please? Good. Okay. Um, the first one. The first, first one. Yeah. This one first. And and the reason I wanted to do that was to ask you. Um, what st if we were to look at what's in this proposal um, would it look like that at, on the shoreline from the lake line project well we took a look at the um, the actual landscape plan for the pump station and when staff looked at it, it looked to us that the uh, planting plan was about a hundred percent and the softened uh, structure there was a result of what uh, where did we because this is a great project and it's a really good example of how to soften the shoreline and have enough vegetative cover enough, enough native vegetation to provide for filtration of toxics coming off you know any of the landward structures so how did we get to such a creative design is my question how do we get to the 25 percent that no how do we uh, how do we design this project Wh what whose standards oh, do we well, use uh, well this is as I understand it was uh, part of the mitigation for the sewer la lake line right. uh, project and uh, the review was not only to meet any regulatory standards of the city but also to do mitigation for the uh, potential impacts of the, the lake line so it was an enhancement of the existing uh, shoreline right so it, it, that's that's a really good example of, I think, where we were trying to go with this particular update to the shoreline master plan. Would, okay, thank you. Uh, if you could keep the other slide up that shows the vegetative strip. Um, my qu second question is, how do we do the um, no net loss math if we don't have this kind of a design for replacement? Because I'm having a hard time understanding if we've got how, what were the number of parcels that potentially could have replacement projects? Replacement projects uh, of the house or? No, of the overwater structure of the shoreline. So you've got X number of parcels that already have structures and hardened um, oh, shorelines yeah. on them. Yeah, a significant number. So 400 plus. And then. So those are going to stay the same. So the 400 is going to stay pretty much static. And and we kind of went around on the number of potential new docks, and that's going to be what, maybe 20? Um, 10. I, I, the number of new parcels that are developable is a very, very small number. I think right. we decided it was under 10. Under 10. Um, you know, the big thing on Mercer Island are going to be the, the um, redevelopments of right. the upland structures. That's where a lot of activity is going to occur over time. And um, there's going to be, you know, two elements to that. One is the regulatory element, what is required to happen on the, on the uh, shoreline. The other one is the in permissive encouragement, what's allowed to happen. And there are a, a couple provisions, as you know, in the, in the draft that allow for soft bank restoration and in fact right. encourage soft bank restoration um, <clears throat> so those are those are the things that over time uh, we want to encourage and I completely agree with that and I guess to what extent how can we because we heard some testimony earlier about the burden of going through multiple permits in order to get to potentially a project like this mm -hmm. and it's 
disappointing to hear that you know a landowner would want to do that but yet having the burden of going through all that permitting they backed away uh, what could we do to to align our city state and federal designs requirements like this so that it's streamlined and if I go in and I want to build that project I should have some incentive in terms of time and cost to be able to do that as opposed to just kind of do the status quo yeah, there's, did you uh, guys do any analysis on how we could streamline that to make it yeah there's more one effective? there's well there's one very important provision in the in the draft um, let's assume that this uh, line had been a hard bank in here that's a little bit uh, waterward from where the high water mark is now uh, under the proposed regulations any change to the high water mark if the structure were here and if you rolled it back and the and the new high water mark was here you would measure the setback from the old high water mark right. so there it's it's called uh, restoration is held harmless so that it encourages people to do the restoration to do the soft bank roll back the shoreline without having to roll back their setback for their structure and uh, I'm hoping that over time uh, we'll be able to see some people who want to do the right thing uh, who who uh, want to do this but they also want to take care of their property and make sure that they don't lose any development rights yeah and I agree with that I guess my concern is I can't get to no net loss if given the provisions we have currently for replacements uh, you don't in, in, in looking at opportunities to do off-site mitigation we really don't have any uh, because um, all of the restoration work we've done for Lake Line and we've done with other funds at Luther Burbank those are all are those are those all a part of the baseline uh, they currently exist today what does not exist today are all of the other improvements to Luther Burbank that but for funding uh, would continue the restoration of the shoreline down to the um, to other parts of the park where it hasn't been uh, touched also the restoration uh, some of which is underway now uh, to the uh, uh, type 1 wetland which is part of the lake ecosystem and, and restoration of that um, system and who's paying, uh, who's paying for all of those enhancements um, I think parks is chipping away at at uh, some of the restoration um, I'm sure that Bruce would be able to give you a fuller rundown but we have uh, Bruce and I have talked many times about uh, the opportunities for shoreline restoration that exist at Luther Burbank and other street end parks and other parks uh, that over time would help restore the shoreline the health of the shoreline do we have any provisions uh, because in in the current draft on page seven uh, under 2 B I we speak to off-site mitigation permitted while on-site mitigation is preferred off-site mitigation may be permitted at the discretion of the code official so do you have in mind any kind of uh, mitigation program whereby if an individual can't mitigate on their parcel you have sites identified and costs and functions also identified in order to do that um, we do have a general list of habitat and environmental improvements that the Parks Department has on their drawing board but for funding that um, if an opportunity came where the private property owner went through mitigation sequencing uh, 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 avoid minimize and mitigate <coughs> and there was a better opportunity for the mitigation off-site um, I, I don't think our regulations should prohibit that opportunity but that's really all it is at this point is an opportunity um, as opposed to a, a rule that says you cannot do that you cannot do an off-site mitigation and then uh, lastly again I think we've got kind of a mishmash of different standards in this current proposal but we've got standards if we're going to do less than 50% we've got standards if we're going to do more than 50 percent replacement and then we have standards if we're going to build a new structure uh, all of which seem to be very confusing and they may in fact be much different than what would happen if they went to the core and had a consultation with the federal government in order to do the project so it seems like we've got th 
three, maybe four different standards uh, that a homeowner is supposed to sort through in order to come to an agreement on what that project's going to look like? Well, <clears throat> there's no doubt that it's complex. Um, the standards are just that. They're standards that if you meet them, then you can expect to get a permit from the city of Mercer Island. Um, if you don't meet those standards, then you won't get the permit unless you choose the alternate development process, which in effect would be a core consultation, where you go to the core, right. go to Fish and Wildlife, make, work out your deal with them, make sure that they're happy, and bring it to the city, and the city would then independently determine no net loss on the project, because I think we have to under state law, and then make a decision to grant the permit. Wouldn't it be much easier to do it like we do with a home where, you know, if I'm going to remodel my home, I'm going to remodel it to the current building code. Um, why not do the same thing with this? Whether it's a remodel or a new structure, that code is the same, whether it's from the federal government, the state government, or local government. I think we could do that if, um, if the federal and state governments adopted code, but the fact is they haven't. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, Bruce. Um, Tim, I, want, I guess I want to just ask, maybe it's one of Mike's questions asked slightly differently, but uh, Mr. Harper's comments, there were a lot of very eloquent comments this evening, and I'd uh, first of all thank folks for being here and being passionate about this. Uh, but in particular, Mr. Harper's comments about spending upwards of 30000 and ending up unable to do something that sounded like it was I mean, I guess what I envision is that we have a process here where if you're shifting to something that is just head and shoulders above what exists today, you should have a uh, uh, permitting process that's, uh, you know, sort of on ice. You, you slide right through. Uh, whereas if what you're trying to do is push up against all the barriers and do something difficult, you naturally are going to end up spending quite a bit of time and money as you as you do battle with the different agencies, all of whom are saying the same thing to you, which is you're, you're pushing the limits here and, and you can't do what you're trying to do. So uh, the question, uh, I mean, the troublesome part to me is t in doing this ordinance, we haven't really looked at what the process is of actually applying for permits and whether we're creating uh, the intended outcome, which is easy permitting when you're doing the right things. Can you speak to me oh, about oh. how one goes through this and how we make this easy so that, that okay. people who are headed that direction have it easy? Well, this is a, a significant part of the Planning Commission's debate of how, how do we uh, manage, on one hand, the state mandate that's telling us we must adopt an SNMP, and on the other hand, federal and state governments, which have their own sets of regulations governing, in many cases, exactly the same thing. It's a very complex situation. Uh, it, permitting is, um, is very, very difficult when you come into this, um, this arena. Um, in terms of the Planning Commission's recommendation, they have provided for basically the alternative development standard, which essentially says if you can uh, satisfy the core, if you can satisfy fish and wildlife, and that evidence satisfies the local need for no net loss, city is going to issue you your, your permit. We're not going to run you through the ringer again with another set of regulations that may be different than the Army Corps or Fish and Wildlife. I mean, the worst permitting uh, scenario that you can uh, encounter is when a development project is approved by the city approved by the Corps and rejected by Fish and Wildlife, or approved by the Corps, approved by Fish and Wildlife, and rejected by the city. I mean, you get people literally pulling their hair out and saying, what am I supposed to do? Because you have these potentially conflicting uh, regulations. So uh, the Planning Commission's work really worked hard to try to minimize that and uh, didn't want to overlap or overstep or uh, create regulatory boundaries, more regulatory boundaries than people would face with the federal and state agencies. I, 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 I want to 
sort of shift sure. what you said in a slightly different direction and, and at the risk of antagonizing this audience. Uh, I, um, what I'm looking at, what I'm, what I'm after is not how do we not have regulation that conflicts, but, but how do we make the, the regulatory or threading one's way through the regu regulatory process easy for those who are, are headed in the direction of, of things that improve their property. And so uh, I hear what you're saying about what the Planning Commission was trying to do, which essentially sort of abdicate to the, to the other agencies. That's not where I'm su suggesting right. um, or, or thinking it necessarily makes sense to go. What I'm thinking is that you, 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 s you somehow are providing a, uh, uh, an easy road you know, an easy route for people, I guess, to flow through. And every every waterfront homeowner's been through a lot more of this than I have. So, I having been through none of it. But but the question is, how do you make it easy for people? Do they go to one agency first and sort of get a guarantee that then, if if it passes there, it's going to pass elsewhere? Well, that's you know, that's what we are hoping to get from Ecology. Now, they can't speak for the core because that's a whole different world, but. Um, what we're hoping from Ecology is that they will look at our development standards and say, in this case, those development standards meet no net loss and are okay. So we can tell our customers, if you meet these standards, um, you're going to get a permit from us and hopefully the state agencies and perhaps even the feds. Um, if you can't meet those standards, then you still have the ability to go to those agencies like you are today required to go to them and um, and uh, work out whatever arrangement um, you can with them. It's oftentimes a very arbitrary and frustrating system because we don't have clear specific rules and guidance that can apply across the three levels of government. We've got three levels of government that are often bumping into each other. Mike? Director, I'd like clarification or confirmation that the alternative uh, development standard, when we go to the core or Fish and Wildlife, that they're not going to say, you need to go down to your city and get a permit first. It's a chicken or the egg issue. So are you telling me that DOE and Fish and Wildlife, when our consultant, since it's much too complicated for a citizen to do it, a, a consultant, an expensive consultant, goes to them and says, and says I have a client that I want to develop this property or this this pier or dock or whatever, and I want to go th and get it approved through you first, that they're going to say, okay, that they're not going to say, well, you need to get the approval through your city first. The classic catch-22 where you can't find the beginning or the end to any right. process. Um, if that is the uh, response to either of the agencies, um, what we would probably do is take the information that the applicant is going to submit to the agencies. We would probably look at that and we would probably issue a permit with two conditions, approval of Fish and Wildlife and approval of the Corps. Any other questions? Yeah, Dan. So let, me, let me understand this. I'm, I'm, maybe I'm trying to so what you've got now is we've got these development standards that we've, the Planning Commission for the most part, has put in place here. And under, on page 7, it says on B2A, it says, when a shoreline development complies with all applicable development standards of this section, there will be a rebuttable presumption that the project does not create a net loss of ecological function. So then when you get to then on page 24 on the alternate development standards, um, the development basically says that you can ignore all the development standards if it's approved by ecology in the core or by fish and wildlife in the core and the applicant demonstrates to your satisfaction that the proposed project will not create a net loss. But so this is maybe this is the same catch twenty two that, that I'm that you were referring to with Mike, but so what the ordinance sets up is says that 
if you comply with the development standards, there's a rebuttable presumption of no net loss, but then you can get out of the development standards if you can prove no net loss. And approval. And you get the and approval, approval and you get the core and, and fish and, and wildlife. Fish and wildlife, yes. Okay, that's so, correct. There, so are, there are two tracks to approval. Right. And so so let me understand under that world, someone is going under the alternative development sta alternative standards. What do they do when they walk in the door and say, I want to apply under this section, the alternative development standards? What where is it, where would I look in this in this ordinance to see what the standard is that how you will determine no net loss because now the development standards are no longer applicable? What we would do is uh, a lot of that would be the administrative function of putting together the permit application and any application checklist that would be required. Uh, it would include, I would think, typical. No, I'm just, I'm just where, where in the ordinance would I, if I'm trying to, if I'm the, the applicant trying to say, how do I, what, what's, how do I, how do I demonstrate to the code official, no net loss because I'm not going to comply with these development standards. How, where, where would I, what page would I look at to find out what the test is, and what, and where would you, as the code official, look to in this ordinance to determine how? you're going to figure out whether there's no net loss since the development standards are inapplicable? Well, it would be, again, the uh, preponderance of evidence based upon the type of a project that's submitted. Where, and, where would I see and that in here? Where, where would I see that in the, in the ordinance? I'm, I'm just, I'm not trying to be, I'm just trying to understand. Right. Where in the ordinance does anyone look to, to f you know, because we've, we've now heard a lot of people testify tonight and earlier nights that they want clarity and they want their rights protected. And we've heard Mike and Ciro and, and others talk about the need for an expedited process or a process everyone can understand. So I'm, I'm just, and, and I, I'm maybe I'm just coming late to the party here and understanding what, what, how this ordinance works, but it's suddenly, in listening to the discussion over the last 20 minutes, it's dawned on me that everything we've talked about on development standards can be thrown out the window if you f try to come in under that one sentence which says if you can demonstrate no net loss and so I'm fine with that I guess but now I want to know how you as a code official what what language in here that you as a code official will point to to make that determination yeah, if and I may please it, well, I'd like just a minute. Oh, let, and then we'll get to you um, one of the very important uh, elements of this proposal in front of you is that we are incorporating the SMP within Mercer Island's Unified Development Code. And that's atypical. Many cities are adopting a whole big fat 100, 200, 300 page regulatory structure with their own uh, administrative provisions, their own procedures. Ours is fitting into our Unified Development Code. And within that Unified Development Code, there are a number of provisions in the administration section and other parts of the environmental section with which uh, establish the process and procedures that authorize us to do checklists, application forms, requirements for um, outside um, experts if needed. Uh, and we would utilize those portions of our existing code to construct the checklists and, um, and applications to uh, fulfill that requirement. Uh, again, if there's, uh, you know, the opportunity for appeal on all these things, so if we're too rigorous or too less than too rigorous, we Well, but that's what I'm trying to understand, Tim. When you go before the ALJ or, or Superior Court and the, the judge says, you know, Ms. Stewart, please tell me what standard you were applying here, where, which, which provision of the ordinance you were looking to, what will you say to him? There, there are provisions in both the WACs and the RCWs that talk about what our no net loss standard means, and we would rely upon those. If, if I might just jump in for a second, too, I think that it's not just reliance on that first sentence, but the requirement that says and, and it would have to comply with. Uh, Army Corps of Engineers and Fish and Wildlife, no, I, so it's I, not just. I understand that, Katie. Okay. I, I, I fully appreciate they'd have to get, but then Tim still has to make his determination under, under small i, 
demonstrates right. the code official satisfaction that the proposed project will not create a net loss in the ecological function of the shorelands and shows that he's got the permit. So Tim is going to have to make that demonstration. And I'm sure he's capable of doing it. I'm just, I just, I'm just trying to understand what he's going to look at in this ordinance to make that determination. You know, I, you, we're both lawyers. You, you, know. you know that you need something to refer to to I make a determination. I would be so sure that he'll be able to produce what the definition of no net loss is. It's my understanding that either the Corps or Fish and Wildlife um, granted a million dollars to one of the local communities who's going through this process to actually define what no no, no net loss is. So we, we throw out no net loss like everybody knows what it is and how to prove it. But I'm not necessarily sure at the regulatory levels that you can find that document that that, that is what no net loss is. Don't you find that strange? <laughs> well, I do find it strange. I find that the reality of the regulatory process or the regulatory uh, system that we're in, Councilmember Grouse, I mean, I, I do find it strange. Yeah, I, I, it, but the it, point is, is that um, I don't necessarily, I'll ask you the question, is there a document that shows you that defines what no net loss is with some sort of value and weights, et cetera, on all the many different facets of development and change that you can do? Not that I know of. Okay, so there you go. It's not defined, and, the, <laughs> and one of the agencies, regulatory agencies, the meetings that, that we went to recently as uh, council members, independent council members, uh, a million dollar grant has been granted for a community to come back and define what no net loss is. So, you know, it's another catch-22. Well, yeah, and I would say further that uh, during the Planning Commission's uh, numerous meetings, at one time, uh, Department of Ecology came up with a definition of no net loss that was circular in its uh, and basically gobbledygook and nobody could understand what in the world it meant and they withdrew it and as far as I know there's been no replacement definition and therefore maybe that's the reason for this uh, attempt by funded by who was it now to come up with that definition so uh, and we don't want to punish our citizens for ambiguous regulations that you can't put your finger on. I, that's um, that was that was meant to be a question. Okay, I appreciate that. I, <laughs> council Member Grady, did you have something? Did you? Well, it piggybacks on um, Council Member Krause's uh, question because it gets back to my original question, Tim, about the no net loss math because I'm having a hard time coming up with that based on what's in this product and what the Planning Commission provided to us. Um, so it sounds like there is a need for some um, metrics associated with fu current baseline functions and you have some of that but <clears throat> more specifically metrics associated with when functions are lost where do you enhance them or where do you have off-site mitigation possibilities yeah that's um, that's going to be part of uh, the major work that um, staff does over the next few months as we put together our formal submittal to ecology um, we were reluctant to proceed down that road before we knew where the council was in terms of um, of its policy decisions on some of these significant issues. Um, again, the target audience for this is the director of ecology, who is the one that uh, must certify that over the 20-year period, the city's program as a whole must meet the standard of no net loss. And if the ecology's director decides that or decides that it doesn't, then of course that decision is subject to appeal and there are a whole bunch of appeals going on right now across the state that would perhaps clarify that question. Well, Tim, Tim, Tim we understand that, but, but my concern is similar to Dan's where you have specific sections that refer back to you to make a determination on the no net loss math. And from what I've heard so far, it sounds like my, my comfort level is nowhere near where it should be in terms of um, you being given the right information at the beginning, and two, given all that information, how do you decide, in fact, that there is no net loss? So I guess it's more of a, a request than a question. We need to do our homework on that to not yeah. only the, the bolster the, the the possibility that you, you're making the right decision, but also to give certainty to the landowner that 
once that decision is made, it's very transparent and it is done, you know, given all the best available science. Yeah. Well, there, there is a body of, um, a, a pretty good body of work uh, around wetlands and riparian areas and, um, and what impacts and what mitigation are equal to or greater than. And um, I think that the science regarding lakes and the structure of those decisions uh, is at a, at a younger evolution. Um, so, you know, as the court cases move forward, as decisions are made and appealed, up, uh, overturned, upheld, I think those decisions will become clearer. Uh, but this is a question that not only Mercer Island is facing, it's a question that, in fact, everybody across the state who's struggling with this issue um, is facing. Um, yeah, hey, Tim, you know, Tim, it seems to me I recall what, during the planning session, the staff presented an analysis, analysis of uh, no net loss and uh, developed a set of metrics. And it, uh, it was something like this, that over the next 20 years, there's likely to be a certain number of new docks. And it was just a handful, of a few do new docks a year over 20 years. And that a new dock uh, would uh, be a net loss overall in the aggregate. So the metrics went something like this to balance that net loss out. What are we going to do? And the various things that uh, uh, came up with, and the staff did this work, uh, was mitigation on other sites, for instance, improvements at Luther Burbank. It, uh, for instance, on a renovation or replacement or repair of an existing dock, if we say, you know, if you go over 50 percent, you have to do 40 uh, percent translucent or uh, decking that allows light penetration, that creates a net gain to offset the net loss of just a few, a handful of new docks. So, right. as I recall, you went through that kind of analysis, and that's where was formed the basis on which this whole SMP was developed. Yes, you're correct. So I have a question on no net loss again. So for instance, if we repl if, if a, a homeowner replaces planking with the graded decking, I mean, you don't have to tell me what that's worth, but just what would be the unit that you would measure that in? Uh, increased light. I mean, there's no unit, though. I mean, there's not a decibel or a uh, the, the way there's that nothing I, that you can compare. Well, we made an improvement here with the light, and that is a unit. What would you call it? Widget? Gidget? Well, you'd, 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 one way you could do it is to measure like for like. So if you had one new dock that was 50% light transparent, then assuming that you'd have 50% non transparent, that would be offset by a re repair, which would be 50% transparent. Of and course, so but there's no correlation no net loss between, between doing a two. mitigation on Luther Burbank. It, you're going to do a completely different mitigation at Luther Burbank. How would you, and the worry Possibly. I get there, the worry I get there is that we're going to, you know, while the mitigations were, well, let's see, we've got a project over here at Luther Burbank for 15,000 homeowner. If you pay 15,000, then th that's the unit, that's the amount of mitigation that will give you if you do X, Y, Z, because yeah, the, we happen the, to have a demand for this project. The important thing to rec uh, recognize on an off-site mitigation or any scheme of that nature would be that it would have to be voluntary on the part of the applicant. It would not be something that we would mandate. It would be something that, hey, I got a better idea. Is that, Does this make sense? Is this going to have a better bang for the buck? You know, there are a million different scenarios and a million different individual situations out there, and it's very, very difficult to foresee all of them. Tim, the reality is, it, would we in that scenario have the homeowner, it's like a fee and loop program, we, they would put the value of that mitigation into a Luther Burbank shoreline restoration bank, and, and as dollars accumulate, we would do it. If, I mean, if there was the need and the demand to build that type of program, we could. Uh, those are pretty administratively intensive to get all those systems in place. One way we have done it since I've been here, uh, there was a wetland mitigation that um, didn't really make a lot of sense on site. And Bruce and Parks had a wetland enhancement project teed up, ready to go. 
Um, I, staff said, hey, why don't you go down and look at this project? It looks to be like a much better project for the environment at a lower cost and the owner and and so the project's been built right it's very similar to how we do off-site mitigation for stormwater projects yeah. uh, we, we do that commonly now mm -hmm. isn't it true too that um, over the next 20 years the city might have the opportunity to take some leadership as like hardscape at some of our parks and street ends um, wears down we can actually create beaches and uh, oh we we are we are doing that right now and um, mm -hmm. we're talking uh, city staff is talking about um, all the things that we're doing in stormwater and all the things that we're doing in terms of environmental enhancements rain gardens soft scaping the landscape uh, all of that stuff um, and it's pretty impressive when you start looking at it we we actually did somewhat prompted by the council's debate here start looking at ways that we could within the stormwater utility ramp up some of our uh, water quality improvement activities in some of the key uh, outfalls around the island uh, on the argument that we we think we could probably get as much water quality bang for the buck uh, in salmon restoration from that as we could from uh, shoreline dock and, and upland and, and all of that would be a net gain in ecological yeah. function yes, to offset any net net loss from a new dock. It also has the, the sort of the ad benefit. If we do that kind of work, we do it through the stormwater utility, which spreads the cost of that out across all the ratepayers rather than just those that own waterfront property. And so there's got a, there's an equity issue in there. That's correct. Mike. That's a, yep. Tim, back on page uh, seven, exhibit two. <clears throat> under the general re regulations, um, under number two, no net loss standard of mitigation sequencing. Um, no development shall be approved unless the applicant demonstrates to the code official satisfaction the shoreline development will not will not create a net loss of ecological function in the shorelands. And I bring this up because there seems to be a misunderstanding that you you can move forward with a project that would create a net loss of ecological function without having to do anything about it or to rely on the city at some point in the future to do some form of restoration work at a city-owned property. Can you clarify that, please? Um, it's important to recognize that, that we do have standards for uh, satisfaction of the no net loss standards following in item 2, 2A and 2B. And those are the standards that we would use to reach that conclusion. Right. And so to say that over a 20-year period, as Council Member Brown pointed out, the city may do something good, that would not comport with this section. Because if I'm a landowner or a homeowner and I come in and I want to do a project and it's going to have a net loss of ecological function, I don't say to you, for instance, I'm hoping the city will do something at Luther Verbank over the next 20 years to offset the loss of function from my project. That's correct. But the standard with ecology is the overall 20 years, um, and it, it involves not only the regulations, but there's a whole big section on the programs that we have in place now, including the stormwater uh, management program, which we will be uh, uh, arguing with Ecology that these are, in fact, benefits over time uh, that we will be gaining in terms of water quality and habitat. And Gr granted, but it, it, it's what we've just discussed does not let the homeowner off the hook if they have a project that's creating a net loss of e ecological function. That's correct. The, uh, the applicant making the application for new construction or restoration would have to m either meet the standards or get a special um, alternative standard through the core and wildlife. Thank okay. You. Any other questions? Yeah, there's on that same page on page 7 in 2B there's a sentence which I hadn't looked at before it says the plan shall accomplish no net loss of ecological function by avoiding, minimizing, or mitigating adverse impacts to ecological functions or ecosystem-wide processes. Um, but that's, that is not, I mean, that, that may be the sentence that actually tries to define no net loss, 
but that actually doesn't apply to anything other than a plan that happens to go with a substantial development project. That that that's, that sentence doesn't apply other than in the in the um, in the su substantial development project context, well, right? Well, well, those words are uh, what's known in the trade as mitigation sequencing, and they're sort of um, held in very high esteem by uh, some regulators. And that process is the process that you go through to uh, figure out whether you can minimize the project, whether you can avoid doing the damage, no, I'm, I'm whether you can uh, mitigate for the damage that's are Right. I'm just tr I'm trying to go back to my earlier point of how you as a code official will will apply the no net loss standard. There's a, That sentence actually gives you some guidance, arguably. Um, but it doesn't seem to apply other than in the context of a substantial development project. Or in the event of an alternative development project. This is only applying to the optional flexible standard, not the regulatory standards. So, I'm sorry, when, when you say optional flexible standards, are you now back to the alternative development yes, standards? Yes, that's the correct. the same thing as optional flexible standards? Yes. They are the same. They are the same. Mm -hmm. These are the general regulations that point to the specific. So why don't we call them then the alternative development standards instead of calling them optional flexible standards in one place and alternative development standards someplace else? Um, you could certainly make that change without objection by staff. <laughs> I, I'm just trying to get some clarity as to what we're doing here. But Council Member Grouse, you asked the earlier question about that B1, Section B1. Yeah. So I'll. You know, it wouldn't hurt to take it out. I don't think it's inconsistent to leave it in. And I'll just say from a practical standpoint, I do like to have in writing the rule that you can't expand a legal nonconformity. But again. No, I, I don't want to take it out. All I want to do is make it just make it subject to the text. I just want to cross reference. I, okay, I don't want to take it out because I think it's important. It's important that you leave it in for the reasons that have been stated by many people tonight and other nights. It, I do it think also it makes it more user-friendly yeah. for people to know, right. turn to page yeah. whatever. So. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Okay. With that, Tim, I think we're going to bring it back to the council now. Um, Don't go away. <laughs> <laughs> Would someone like to make a motion, and then we can play with that? Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to move that we adopt resolution number 1440, expressing intent to adopt an update of the Shoreline Master Program and authorizing the submittal to the Department of Ecology as amended. I'll second that. Okay. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. Discussion? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, <t> <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'm going to try a couple of amendments. Just Some of them are just procedural. The one we just talked about on page 7, um, B to B um, to take out to replace the words optional flexible with alternative I'm sorry what is the well is it alternate alternate or alternative alternative development standards just so it's clear we're referring to the same things which if I understood from Tim he was had no problem with okay do we have a second okay discussion all those in favor what, of that what, what, yeah. Sorry, before you, I just w ask a clarification. Dan started to go there, and I just want to make sure I understand. It appears that alternate, alternative development standards on page 24 is broadly available or applicable at any time, but over on page 7, it's only available on substantial development projects. I'm probably phrasing that a bit wrong, but do we want to also align uh, where you can use these standards. Yeah. And I what mean, I, I might suggest is that it just get dropped out of page 7 so that we're getting the language the same but also the scope the same. I, and, and, and this is probably something we shouldn't be drafting on the run here but I mean, it, it seems like you would want to say whenever a, whenever a substantial development project is proposed, 
or there are alternative development standards allowed for the project. Or, I mean, there's some, I know it says and, but it's, that's what I was asking Tim before. It says, you know, what seems to only apply to substantial development projects, and that's when he said, no, that this is actually supposed to apply to the text on page 24 as well. So, I mean, I, the alternative, Tim, is to just take that one sentence, the plan shall accomplish no net loss of ecological function by avoiding, minimizing, or mitigating adverse impacts, the ecological function, ecosystem-wide processes, and just use that same sentence over in, on page 24 in section C1. I mean, that would accomplish the same thing, and then we get a, we've got some clarity as to what we're trying to talk about here. If that would, if that would, in, in C1 on page 24 down the bottom, where it says, demonstrates the code official satisfaction that proposed project will not create a net loss in ecological function of shorelands. Now, if, if in fact it's that language on page 7 that's being referred to, maybe the simplest way is to take that one sentence, the plan shall accomplish no net loss of ecological function by avoiding, minimizing, or mitigating adverse impacts the ecological functions or ecosystem-wide preferences, processes, I'm sorry. Um, and just putting that sentence that it's not going to change anything, Dan. All I'm trying it's to do is not going to change anything. It's just regularly regulation talk. <laughs> uh, actually, I agree okay. with Councilmember Grass. If I could just jump in, because I think there's right. a little piece you would have to add to that, Councilmember Grass. Where if you see on page seven on um, B, I think you need a part of the sentence before where it says the applicant shall provide the city with a plan that demonstrates that proposed project will not create a net loss in ecological functions because you need to be able to refer back to the plan. So if you just keep that one sentence you want to take, you, you lose what, where the plan is. So I think you have to have that little piece, just a technical suggestion. Yeah, I mean, and, and again, I, I, you know, as, as, as one of the people who spoke tonight said, if we're going to make any changes in it, it's probably only fair to people to give them a chance to look at what we're doing and come back before we adopt anything in, in final. and. Which is, but all I'm trying to do is, is if we can get concurrence on the council to give staff direction to, to try to bring some clarity to that issue. That would okay. Well, yeah. Well, may I bring? May I? Well, no. Ahead. Hold on for a second, uh, Dan. Uh, tell me specifically what your amendment is. Oh, what? Well, that's what I. I don't want to draft on the fly here, but I. Well, my, I know, but we're my, my purpose is to have. My purpose is to take the concept in the sentence that says starts with the plan shall accomplish no net, no net loss of ecological function, and build build that concept. You know, I mean, there's some very good language in in two B, which talks about offsite mitigation. It talks about demonstration no net loss supported by a qualified professional. All that language should probably apply to the text on page 24. So I think it would be relatively easy, but I, I don't want to rush into this, where, where staff could take those concepts and make sure it applies to pay what's on page 24. And, well, that, and that, it's not changing anything, Mike. It's just trying well, to give the people that, you, you keep saying you want clarity for people, and. No, the, the clarity is the streamlining and deferring to higher, regulate, higher regulatory bodies. That's a, the that's a streamlining. What I'm going to suggest to the council is that we keep the big picture in mind, recognizing that this is not going to be the final document. What I'm suggesting is let's dispel with any amendments, pass, the, pass this so that it can go up to DOE, and DOE and our staff will negotiate, as Director Stewart said numerous times, and then we're going to be back here again in, I don't know, six, four or six months. But I think, I, th I think we have we have been represented well by the planning commission, and each time we tweak it, we get further and further from what the planning commission recommended, and I dare say from what our citizens are asking for us. We 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 need to hitch our buggy up with the planning commission because the planning commission has done a very good job, and what I'm suggesting is that we don't approve any amendments. And we pass this as is, recognizing it's not the final step. Mike, I think you make a good point in, in that this is a resolution, not an ordinance. 
and uh, maybe you could elaborate on the distinction, or maybe Katie can, uh, between a resolution and an ordinance. And if we go back, this is well, let's let's fine tune the language here because this is an ordinance that we have to uh, you know have total clarity on when we're going to. This is just uh, one step in a continuing process that. You know, yes. how long is the process going to take from, from tonight here on out? Uh, it okay. a while. But this Mike, month, well, let's just a minute. Hold on. Mike, Grady, then Dan. If. Um, Mike, I guess in response to that and to a lot of the testimony earlier, you know, I worked a lot with the, the construction into things uh, during the daytime. And the one thing I've learned is uh, you have certainty in the regulations and you try to streamline as best you can so you're cutting back on time and cost. And as I go through this again, we really have five different standards that potentially could be met within this document. So we've got standards for new, standards for 50% or more replacement, standards for less than 50%, alternative development standards, and then op this optional flexible standards. So, I mean, I'm having a hard time understanding how, how they all mesh together and if I'm having a hard time I gotta believe that you know a homeowner going to the permit counter is going to have the same problem well the homeowner but doesn't I, go to the permit counter the homeowner pays for a consultant to do it is, well, is the reality of it. well but that's not the answer I mean the answer is it needs to be streamlined it needs to be transparent and it needs to be easy to follow and I have to say that um, if I'm having a hard time with it um, you know well I'm, this, I'm does, sure this doesn't work. have everything that I like with it I mean, we've mucked it up from what, not not too terribly badly, but we have changed it from what the planning commission gave us. I understand where we have these issues, and that's part of the process. I mean, it's, I'm sure it's not everything that you want. It's not everything that I want. It's not everything that, but we're at a point to where we need to move this thing forward, and DOE and staff needs to hash it out. Okay. Well, but in response to that, um, you know, having worked with DOE for many a year, I, I don't think that expectation is correct I mean for us to pass it off to ecology and say would you s make sense out of this and find ways to streamline it they're not going to do that they're going to do a substantive test on whether it meets you know the requirements within the shoreline M master act you know they're not they're not going to tweak it in to make it easier for us and the homeowners t to go through the process so I'm with Dan I think you know we need to find some way to make this far more easier to follow and bring the standards into alignment so that there aren't these various exit ramps or other standards that may apply. You know, it needs to be far simpler than the way it's presented. Chris? I, I, Mike, I, with all due respect, I, th I think you, m you misrepresent what's what folks are attempting to do here with, with your comments because I, I think the, the staff's intent was that this optional flexible standards and this alternative development standards be the same thing they just ended up with different language and by by unify or by by aligning the language between the two and we make life simpler for everybody rather than allowing uh, extra confusion to exist and so I, I would support just get the language aligned Bruce why don't we ask staff what was your intent yeah thank you um, well I really do appreciate Council Members Grau's concern about drafting these things on the fly because I've had a chance to read more carefully 2B on the optional standards. And uh, not only does it apply to the substantial development projects, but if you read further down, it also allows for this process to occur when you have a discretionary decision such as a variance or a shoreline conditional use permit. Uh, and it establishes the plan and the standard for meeting those plan when you have either of the three actions, alternative development standard, shoreline variance, shoreline conditional use permit. So I withdraw my original non-objection to the change of the language. I'd prefer to keep as optional flex flexible standards yeah. because right. it covers more than just the uh, alternatives. Well, we don't have an amendment on the table. Do we have? No, but I'm sorry. I'm, I'm I, I lost. I, can I, I got I, lost too on that. Tim, okay. where where in it? Where please tell me, Tim. Where in two B, is there any reference to the words alternative development standards? How would I know that two B applies to the text on page twenty four? 
because well, it is an optional flexible standard. Well, but I'm sorry, I, I can read that too, but where, how do I as a lawyer know that optional flexible standards includes alternative development standards? What, what, what tells me that? I'm trying to help you on this thing. Yeah, I'm not well, trying to hurt you on it's this. It's clear in my mind maybe I'm missing something. Yeah, I'm, well, show me. Where's the language? Please, point me. Katie, point me to the language which shows me how I get from page 7 to page 24. Please. How do I do it? I, I, actually, I agree with Councilmember Grouse. So I, I, think, I think that it, it does behoove us to take a, a closer look at that, too, because I think there's um, some of the pieces we could work on. Well, Okay, let me ask that. Tonight we're actually we're trying to adopt a resolution and Correct. send it on to ecology. Now we're talking about it seems like some pretty complicated connectivity things and different moving parts to do this. Well, I think what you're talking about is not changing any substance but just making the the words and the logical flow fit. I don't think Dan's trying to change anything substantively. It's just trying to, he's thinking like a lawyer. And he, the other lawyer happens to agree. So what I would urge you to do <laughs> is let Katie write the words so that it doesn't change any of the substance, but it, it meets sort of a, a good logical legal flow test. Okay, now how do we procedurally do that? Do we have to make a motion or is that a, a function I think you could do housekeeping. I think what you could do is you could still approve the resolution tonight and add add the caveat on the uh, motion that the staff will however you want to phrase it clean up any inconsistencies pursuant to what's been discussed tonight. I, I it, that's off it, the fly. And we're still going to get another bite of this when it comes back anyway. Right. And right. and and with what council member Grouse is suggesting is sort of just sort of the very technical pieces to work it through there to allow the example that he gave earlier to just put in the standards it's consistent with everything that's happened before so it does okay. it, it does it does tweak it I think it actually answers some of your concerns uh, council member Ciro so you can adopt the resolution tonight with that caveat and then um, we'll send it off to ecology and you'll get the other bite okay Dan does that work for you yeah, I mean, I, is there any urgency to send it off to ecology before the September meeting? I mean, if normally this would be like a, this would be the equivalent to what would be like a first or second reading on, on an ordinance where we just give staff direction, have them clean it, and bring it back to us. But Dan, you're forgetting that this is the third or fourth meeting we've had on the online that. management no. uh, program, so it's not like it's the first or second reading. We've been at this. I understand. I understand. For many those number meetings but this I mean at, and and I have the utmost respect for what the Planning Commission went through because it's a very complex thing and 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 to be honest as I said before it's some of the discussion that's gone on in the past hour and a half now two hours almost was very enlightening because it, it, it suddenly I suddenly realized how this whole statute fits together and it it, it it's important to get it to fit together okay. correctly, right? But I'm, but I'm hearing there's no substantive changes. Well, that's just those are coming, but that's what. Well, <laughs> 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 but I. No, <laughs> we were just but, working but, on the easy one. Here. No, I'm just <laughs> let, let's stay focused on this one issue. Yeah. Okay, this one issue, we're saying is that staff would would clean up the language to make to get rid of the inconsistencies, but there is no substantive change. Right. Correct. Exactly. exactly. Okay. So then. It, what, what Councilmember Grouse is ask, asking for is technically what an attorney or an expert I get would come and look through to be able to read it go A, B, C, D. Okay. Right? Council, can I ask you a question because it's going to be a footnote. Is that good to go with that instruction? Okay. So we have concurrence on that. Is there another amendment or an amendment well, for this? Just so I'm clear, Katie, the two things we're talking about that are then are B1 and and that the issue, the change on B1 as well, and the change on B2, just to make that consistent. Correct. Okay. Okay. Are there any B1, B2, where? On page seven. It's the. It's just to make the text on B1 cross-reference the text on page 23 and 24, I believe, and the uh, text on B2. Cut. Make sure that applies to alternative development standards. Okay, Katie, you good? Yes. Okay. Any amendments to the motion? Hey, well, any further discussion? 
Yeah. I'd, I'd like to discuss the 50 percent um, change in um, uh, page 24, uh, number V, which reads, if, 50, if more than 50 percent of the structure's exterior surface, including decking, or structural elements, including pilings, are replaced or reconstructed, the replaced or reconstructed area of the structure must comply with the following standards. Um, again, I think that there are different parts of the structure, the dock, we're talking about the surface, decking is one thing, pilings and stringers, and I would rather see language that says if more than 50 percent of the structure, which includes decking, structural elements, pilings, are replaced. It, it just separates it instead of 50 percent of the exterior surface being one thing, 50 percent of the pilings being another thing. I'd like to see that put together so that the homeowner could make some changes without having to um, do an entirely new dock if they just, for example, replace 50 percent of the surface of the dock. Well, you know, I think you make a good point uh, there, uh, Jane, because um, I can see a, a number of situations where uh, dock owners want to just do the decking. And whether you replace 51% of it or 49% of it, to replace the decking is a totally different uh, undertaking, a much easier deck uh, undertaking that uh, to which, um, you know, A through F, uh, many of those don't even apply. Um, the, as I quickly look at it here, if we're just doing the deck re uh, decking replacement, the only thing that really applies is this 40% uh, uh, light transmittance uh, requirement. Mm -hmm. The rest of the stuff doesn't apply if you're just doing the decking. And so that's something that I think we should uh, work on there. But that's what yep. it says. It says the replaced or reconstructed area of the structure must comply with, this, with the following standards. It doesn't say you have to make the whole thing conforming. It just says the stuff you're working on has to comply with it. So. I mean, what, whatever the trigger is, it's not like you got to rip everything else out to to then come into compliance. It's just all you got to do is the areas that you're working on have to comply with these requirements. Well, so right. is it then clear? I mean, is that well? Let's ask staff yeah, because yeah, here's our code Jim, people. Jim. Is yes. that correct? If yeah. you're just going to do the decking, all you have to do 51% uh, of the decking. All you got to do is 40% uh, light transmittance, and you don't have to address any of the others, uh, A, C, D, E, and F. Is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's what the words you, say. You so have to be okay. careful, though, when you practically do that, because the substructure of a dock for planks is completely different than the substructure for the 40% grading. So you can't, you're not, your, your conventional deck, or your, your traditional deck uh, pier out there, or dock out there, with your planks, you're not, and you want to have to replace 51% or all of them. You're not going to, you're not going to uh, put a 40% opaque grading through there without changing the substructure. So in practice, in practice, it's not going to happen. But I think we could clarify this if we just said, if more than 50% of the structure is replaced or, cons or reconstructed. The replaced or reconstructed area of the structure must comply with all of the following standards. I have no problem with any of the rest of it, but um, I think saying the decking or the other structural elements, that's two different things. Uh, I agree with you. I agree with you. Okay, do we have an amendment, a proposed amendment? Change order and. Uh, if you just simply change or to and then I think you might meet your objective. All right, yeah. So go ahead and make the amendment there, Jane. Uh, here's the proposed amendment then uh, for um, number V on page 24. Yeah. If, um, if more than 50% of the structure's exterior surface, including decking and structural elements, including pilings, are replaced or reconstructed, or the replaced or reconstructed area of the structure must comply with the following standards. So. I'll second that. Okay. 
discussion. Okay, all those in favor? Wait, wait, wait. No, I'm not there yet. At the end of the day, do, do you want, Tim, this, do you want to measure the volume of all these different elements or have the homeowner measure the, 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 the volume of pieces of wood and, and come up with? Oh, we what do that. We do that every day. Okay. Then uh, where we're going with this is, uh, I, I mean, I, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. Mike's, Mike Searle's point was a good one, I thought. I, I hadn't thought about it, but you replace the decking and you replace the decking with new materials, you've got to replace substructure. Well, not all so the time and not necessarily. But in some cases, I mean, and, and when you go over the 51%. So in then the what are the implications of doing that and how are we how we're we responding to that, uh, and what is the implication of using an and here, but what also would be the implication of just simply saying if more than 50% of the structure is That's replaced, the same. and then you've same. said same. that you're just looking at the total volume of the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I'm thinking as I think that is we've made it a lot easier for homeowners to duck the limit uh, by by letting them lump the whole thing together. That's exactly Tim, right. Is that that's exactly right. All right. So it's this is a move towards a less stringent standard than what we had before by doing that. That's exactly right. Yep. Do you understand okay. that you just were able to get duck, dock, and deck? <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> okay. I, uh, okay. Um, so, from a staff perspective, what's your feeling about both the uh, ease with which you can measure one versus another, and the end result in terms of the where we're going with regards to where DOE wants us to go? Yeah. The uh, the challenge with the measurement is that you have two fundamentally different things, actually three fundamentally different things. You've got the deck, you've got the structure, and then you've got the pilings. So how, do you, how, do you, how does one equal the other? They're sort of apples, oranges, and pears. Um, we would have to figure out how, how that measure would, would be handled, whether one of the ways would be value. Um, another one would be, uh, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, it, this is going to be a tough one. Wherever you draw that line, uh, it's going to be a tough one to figure out. So, so the, the default wouldn't be to use volume. You, you would no, look at it would, other be, it would be probably some other. Not volume of, of material. So if decking's cheap and Density pilings the are. The material. <laughs> right, and, and pilings are expensive, uh, you would estimate the total cost of doing the job and. 50% would be 50% of the cost of doing it. So decking, because it's cheap, you could maybe do the whole deck, even though it's more than 50% of the volume. And uh, I'm just trying to understand yeah. where, where we're ending up with um, this. We would probably end up establishing some type of administrative standard on that we would use. Um, or, uh, you know, I, I don't know. This is a tough one. How do you, how do you measure? It can't be tougher than determining no net loss calculations. <laughs> oh, well, we'll I put, can't. We'll put those two together and see if we There's can. No what, mo what motivated you to separate exterior surface from, from pilings? It, it, was the, it was the problem of apples and oranges, that decks and pilings are two fundamentally different things. Um, and we were saying 50% of the deck or 50% of the pilings, um, you trigger the replacement of that element with the new standards. So if you go more than half the deck, if you go more, ha more than half the pilings, then you have to do all the pilings, you have to do all the deck. That was the original thinking. It, it, it seems we are complicating this thing so unnecessarily because on number A, the grading there really only applies if you're going to replace the deck. B only applies if you're going to replace the pilings. C and D, I would argue, should apply regardless of what the percentage is. Um, e, 
probably only applies if you're re replacing the pilings. And F, I don't know, F is probably a piling thing also. So I mean, it, it, the only thing I think in this whole thing which relates to the, the deck surface is, is A. So it, it would seem to be a lot easier if you constructed this to say that if, if more than 50% of the, the decking is replaced, then A applies. If more than 50% of the pilings are replaced, then B, B, E, and F should apply. And I would say C and D should apply if you're replacing even a single piling, personally. And Dan, I think you make a good point here. Um, the, um, you know, my, my focus is on the replacing the decking, and I agree, only A should apply to the decking, and so maybe we just carve out uh, A for the decking and as a separate, uh, maybe VI, uh, talk about decking. And when you get over 50%, you have to go 40% light transmittance. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Yes. And then, and, and then, then the rest, the, the rest, rest of it, as you pointed out, probably stands uh, holds together. Yeah, but uh, and and I I would still ask the council to consider just making C and D apply to any replacement of pilings. I mean, I I, I, well, I don't. What would happen if you took the decking? Well, no, I'm just saying. Not, I'm saying if if you replace. You know, 49% of the pilings C and D should still apply. So those yeah. pilings you're replacing, there's no reason to put new chemicals into the water. I mean, why, why would anyone in the right mind do that? Tim keeps telling you, and you don't listen to him, Kim, Tim keeps telling you that's covered by the federal regulation. You know, I mean, do you want a headline or something? My Tim if, tells you that if, if you replace anything, you can't have creosite and all these other things. If, it's anyone, covered. It's if covered. anyone has sat for the last two weeks and watched our federal government in action and are going to sit there and <laughs> say, we should rely upon the federal government, please. I mean, I, 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 I think, think, I think, I think we, we have, have, guys, have, have a member on the table. It's getting late and we're losing focus. We now, Tim, on the table. Tim, let me ask you a question if I could. Sure. This language, I'm sure, was vetted at length by the Planning Commission no, and was this or no? This is this is council language. Oh, you added all this. Oh, that's why we're having a problem with it. No, no, okay, I missed those meetings. Okay, added at the first um, so get first decision. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I took a month off. Now I know. Can, can, we, um, can I ask? Well, wait a minute. Uh, my question is, um, what they're asking for is things to get a little more tied down here and directing specific language in in V. Uh, with A, B, C, and D. Okay, isn't that what's going? That's what Dan is proposing. I I think I'll just. I think that I understand Council Members Grouse is actually a little bit broader with regard to C and D because you want it to apply to the entirety. That you, it's just doesn't matter how much you replace. It's not over fifty percent. And it's the Mercer Island standard, right. independent of the federal and state standard. Right. Well, and, that we, well, and then we could arrange correction, the other. Correction. Of the it's a federal and state standard that we're injecting into our standards so they're consistent which is what we want across the board so you know I completely agree with Dan's comment whether it's one piling or you know 15 pilings they should all comport with C and D because you because you don't want to add more toxins into the environment so, what, so what that's a little bit more substantive sorry that's a little bit but more substantive than doing the other fixes within that section if we were to reconstruct that. So I just think that needs to be clear. I, I think that's an appropriate change, but I think that just want to be clear that that would be a little bit more substantive. We can pull that out and put that in a different section. Okay, okay let me or let make me, it its own section. Let me pull it back here real quick. We do have an amendment on the floor, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay, and it's been seconded. All right. And uh, Allie, could you please read that back because we've been, is it just the one word, correct? And to or, that was it, okay? Let's discuss or to and or to and okay. So that's been moved and seconded. Let's discuss that amendment, okay, uh, Bruce. I think the approach that's been proposed with staff reworking this uh, brings greater greater clarity uh, to the whole situation and doesn't do anything to more complicate homeowners' lives uh, or add extra restrictions. And so I would vote against the amendment and in favor of having staff rework the language. Okay. And Any other comments to the and, amendment? I like Just the amendment. I think it's a good amendment. It uh, is an amendment that staff can manage, can measure. Uh, it's also an amendment that if we pass, it satisfies this issue about grading, being able to replace grading without 
um, tripping the 50 percent and and uh, it keeps the process again the big picture of getting this up to DOE and uh, on our on our timeline okay uh, councilmember Grady did you have a comment I agree with Bruce I, I think you know we were pointing out a number of areas where we can clarify the language and give staff some directions so I would be more inclined to go with along with Dan on this and um, try to find ways that we can work with staff to clarify this and bring it back in September yeah, I, yeah, just watching the reaction of a couple of people in the audience when, the, when we talked about what does this mean and we said and I made the comment well it only replies to the replaced or reconstructed area and a bunch of people said no no that's not what it means I mean I watching the body language so I mean so I, 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 I actually listen to that type of stuff and say okay if, if people don't read it that way so what's going on here and so all we're trying to do is just make it clear what this means and and so I you know, Mike, there's no effort to, to trick you here. I mean, we're, we're not trying to pull a fast one over you. This is just trying to make this make some sense. So okay. let's well, speaking to the amendment, Dan, um, I think the amendment, should be the, the amendment should be defeated simply so we can just let staff fix this thing and make it work correctly. Okay. Anyone else on the amendment? All right. Uh, the amendment, uh, all those in favor of changing or to and say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Nay. Okay. Three four. Three, four. Okay, that failed. Now, the second thing is cleaning up the language. Does anyone have an amendment or direction? I would move that um, that the more than fifty percent of the that the language be added to make it clear that if more than 50% of the decking is being replaced that only paragraph A apply and that if more than 50% of the pilings are being the pilings are being replaced that B D E and F apply what do you mean? I mean B B if Piling. no I'm sorry if if more than 50% of the pilings are being replaced, the B, E, and F apply, and that if any pilings are being replaced, C and D apply. See, what, what, what we have done... Wait a minute, hold on. There's, a, there's an amendment. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, it's been seconded. Now, discussion. What we have done, most common maintenance requirement out there is to replace planking. Uh, replacing all planking on a dock is less than 50% of a structure. What you're going to trip by the language that you said, when you want to replace 51% or you need to replace your planking, you're going to have to replace it with the 40% grading. The structure for the 40% grading is different than the structure for the planking. And people are going to look and they're going to ask, the staff how do I do this I see what it says but how do I put the grading which comes in rectangles the, how do I put the grading which comes in odd which comes in a a basic dimension how do I put that grading right. on a right. dock that's designed for planking well you you're suggesting that additional uh, structural support in in uh, in the form of stringers would be required that's right because that's fine. Whatever is required, Mike. I'm not whatever whatever money it takes. Is that what you're saying? No, but this is what the I'm trying to make it simpler for you. If but on the you know I'm Mike, you're much more knowledgeable than I am about engineering. But it this is all this is saying is that that if you're going to read yeah, you might have to do some different structural supports, but you're not going to have to worry about the the fish window or disturbing bank vegetation. None of that's going to come in here. And that's what I'm trying to do to get out of it. The, 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 what is required from an engineering support standpoint to have the 40% the, the, uh, light transmittance um, platform, yeah, I, it may require some structural changes to it. That, that's what ecology works with. That's what um, development services works with all the time. Okay. More comments on the amendment, proposed amendment? Got it? Well, I guess my sense is that 
we wanted to simplify. We didn't necessarily simplify by putting as much direction into the uh, into the um, uh, proposal that Dan put forth as we'd want. And what we really want is to give staff a bit more of a blank slate to go back and rework this section rather than try and specify exactly what it is we're trying to get out of this. Bruce, Bruce I think you, you have to start from the basic premise that what this is not simply able to be simplified. And, and uh, starting with a premise that we discussed it tonight that uh, amongst the, the three agencies, the Corps, Fish and Wildlife, and the city, you've got arbitrary, confusing, bizarre, and often conflicting requirements. And what we're trying to do, uh, and it's beyond our ability to the extent that two out of three of the agencies we don't control or influence uh, at all. We're stuck with whatever they are, whatever they do, and we're trying to fit our square peg in their round holes half the time, and that's that's the problem we face here. So uh, to get to that ultimate goal of simplicity is very difficult here, just be, uh, you know, for that reason alone. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah. But I, th I think in this case, what we're working on is just the Mercer Island scope of of requirements, not the. I, I love the way you described it, bizarre and you know, all the other things that went along with the other re regulations. But it, my my point is still that I I think Dan, you're you're trying to uh, you're trying to get to the answer, um, but I think you want to allow staff a bit of time to to actually stare at this and make sure that they get it right rather than. Uh, right. As you said on, earlier, on the fly, try and well, push, I'm, push I'm, it. And I, I'm happy to push this until September. If it because I think Mike's point's good. If, 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 one, if decking changes, four <laughs> stringer changes, let's let staff figure out exactly well, what I, makes I, sense. So let, me, uh, let me uh, ask uh, staff for a minute. The, the intent of, of Dan's, I believe, is to simplify the language, right? So it's simplified for staff and the applicant. Does does this proposed amendment accomplish that or not? Well, I, I would suggest it doesn't necessarily simplify, but it clarifies and it segregates decking from pilings right. from structure. I, I get that. I'm just wondering the staff who's going to have to do the code, code enforcement and the interpretation of this, is it doing what Dan is is trying to do? Yes, there would be a little bit more clarity and a little bit more ease in administration. Uh, the challenge that we would face would be the, the support for the new decking. And uh, if you trigger it and require grading, then you do need to reconstruct the whole support structure uh, in order to accomplish that goal. So if it's 50% of the decking, then you're going to be triggering major investment in the support structure and the decking. If it's 50% of the structure, which includes the decking and the pilings, then you'd be reducing um, the number of applications which would be covered. I th does that now, make sense? I'll remind the council. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go okay, ahead. I'll remind the council. Maybe the fix is just delete paragraph V, A, B, C, D, E, and F, because that's not what the Planning Commission originally gave us. That was an amendment by Council Member Grouse. So let's just, I mean, we could take care of this. We've kind of gotten us sit ourselves into a corner. We could get out of that corner by just deleting and re going back to the original product presented to us by the Planning Commission. Okay. We still have... We have the amendment on the. F do we have an amendment on the floor, or no? We don't have. Yes, we do we do? Okay, okay. Excuse me. All right. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, what I yeah. what I was hoping that the staff could do is, if you were, Tim and, and Katie, if you were given the task from the council, to come clarify this section per the conversation going on here, would you come up with this proposal, or because what you what we have here is a question of do we do we amend this language right here and now or do you give the staff direction generally based on the conversation that's happened here for staff to come back with its proposed language and we'll deal with it in September it's either do it now or do it later and the staff needs to say this this is good enough or we would really rather have a crack at it because we think we can improve it 
that's what I would hope you guys could advise the council now. Uh, my preference would be to take the crack at it. I, and I, I mean, yeah, I don't know I about you, Tim, but given given the conversations that have happened, I think there's been enough tweaks that it, I mean, it's part of the whole process. Um, what do you mean by take a crack at it? Yeah. I'm sorry, about, <laughs> about doing what they've suggested, taking a, taking our time to, to uh, go back and as staff rework the pieces where it shows that we could tighten them down a bit. Rather than trying to do it on the fly, I I don't right. like to draft. No, I mean the, the terminology you're using of tighten it down is uh, not ex exactly exciting. I, I think I think what we want to do is if 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 the staff can follow the direction per Dan's posed amendment, which has been seconded, uh, to make those changes. Uh, in my mind, this is all in the area of clarifying, and you know. Tim, you, you raised a very good point in terms of if you go to with uh, graded decking at, at the structural support of that, that's something that probably has to be addressed, but that doesn't entail pilings, most likely, or I would think doesn't include pilings, so you can go from there and right. draft something that uh, in accordance with the discussion here. Yeah, my, my take on it, I, what I heard, and just make sure uh, I heard it correctly, is that for the deck replacement, um, A would apply. For the fi piling replacement, uh, B, E, and F, did I get that right, would yes, apply? Yes, that, that's what I wrote okay. down. And then for all replacements, all materials all would have pilings. to All pilings. All pilings, sorry, would have to meet E and F. No, C and D. C and D. C and D. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Let me, um, let me I think that I, I, if, if that is the council's policy and direction, but I think crafting the words here is a relatively simple thing. To okay, that's say. the amendment on the floor has been seconded, so that's what we're discussing. Okay, hey, can I expand on uh, the discussion a little bit? Because I think what would be helpful for the document in general is to address okay, what applies to all to new, re, you know, remodels, replacements. What applies just for 50% or under? What applies just for 50% or greater? For these details that we've crafted with Dan, and then what triggers uh, the applicant then going off to the court? Because you've got this exit ramp that is kind of woven throughout the document that appears every once in a while, and I, I think a logical sequence where somebody can read through and say, "Okay, I've got to meet all of these things, and then some more, depending on whether it's a new, less than 50 percent, or greater than 50 percent." Well, and you follow? Yeah, but th these our regulations do not relieve the applicant's requirement to get a permit from Fish and Wildlife and Corps. So they're there anyhow. Right. What we're doing is we're uh, imposing Mercer Islands regulations independently uh, on our permits for but not, these activities. Right, but not for all. And, it, and what's not clear in the document is what triggers the homeowner to go off to the core and consult with the federal agency. But, but Mike, what you're suggesting requires a total rewrite of this resolution. No, not necessarily. I think it's just kind of a reformatting so that it follows a logical sequence. Typically when we do regulatory work, uh, we use several documents to help communicate things. There's, usually, there's the, the law, the, the ordinance, um, and then they do checklists and worksheets and lots of the ways to communicate exactly from the homeowner's perspective as they approach the city, how do they experience it? We try to set it up that way. So I, I don't think you want to try and draft the Shoreline Master Program to, to be all things to all people because you just can't, it makes the documents so difficult to write. I think you need to get your policy intent into this and then when we go back, we sort of reshape it to how the homeowner or the property owner has to get through the, the gauntlet uh, exactly the way you're talking about. I think you're exactly right, Mike. I mean, they need to know where are the off ramps. They need to know how this thing's going to fit. And we, it is up to us to, to uh, write the homeowner piece for that. Okay. Yeah, but, yeah but, but I think you can do both. You know, we've done it in other settings. So I think to what extent we can make this a little more transparent and follow a logical sequence would not only help us, but also, uh, you know, the citizens. It's a, it's a use, usability. Okay, yeah, we have an amendment on the floor. It's been seconded. Any more comments on that amendment? 
I guess I just I still want to clarify because the amendment didn't quite capture what Katie and Tim talked about doing. So there's right. there's a difference there's well, a difference the, between the two. That's yeah. irrelevant to what is the amendment is. It is what it is. It is. Oh. And and uh, Allie, do you want to read the amendment? And this is what you're voting on. Do you want me to? Please. <laughs> Please. <laughs> You asked if I wanted to, and I don't okay. really want to, but I will. Would you please? <laughs> amend section, <laughs> amend section MICC 19.07.110E6BV to add language that if more than 50% of the decking is being replaced, then only subsection A applies. If 50% of pilings are only are being replaced, then subsections B, E, and F apply. And if any pilings are being replaced, then subsections C and D apply. Great. Is that, that's it. That was the amendment. That was the amendment. May yeah. I speak to the amendment, please? Yes, please. Okay, so what we are doing, we're making it very difficult, very, read, very expensive for that homeowner to replace the decking. That, that's what we're doing. That's right. Please. And, and what, what do we accomplish with B, C, D, E, and F? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Because it's already covered at higher, at a higher level. And it's, I mean, we're, we're, that was last generation or two generations ago that the issues are addressed in C, D, E, and F. Now, I am not going to support that amendment. Um, what I think, but I'll follow up with an amendment of deleting paragraph V, A, B, C, D, E, and F, which gets us back to the original document given to us by the Planning Commission, and uh, we can go forward from there. Okay. On the amendment, any more comments on the amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Aye. Okay, so how many nays do we have? Okay, so that failed. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to propose an amendment. Yep. I'd like to propose an amendment that we delete paragraphs V, paragraph VA, VB, VC, VD, VE, VF. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Okay, discussion. Again, Mr. Mayor, what this does is that gives us back to the original document that was given to us by the Planning Commission, a document that was discussed, you know, you know the stats, 27 meetings, et cetera, et cetera, and it um, restores a good document to its previous life. So, Mike, does that then default to page 23 um, under B, Development Standards for Replacement, Repair, and Maintenance of Overwater Structures? So then the requirements are you got to meet federal and state permit requirements first, and then we talk about keeping the uh, area with their length the same, which conflicts with sub I because federal and state are not going to say you can keep the same area in width. You follow me? I think. Um, I mean, that's what it's the chicken or the egg. Uh, that's the way to make it. You know, if we need to delete that too. Feel free to step in and do that. <laughs> but again, well, one, one of the objectives that. of many of these council members have been to make it uh, streamlined and efficient. And one of the, right. the best ways to do that is just to defer to the higher regulatory authority. And if we need to delete B, well, uh, go ahead and do that also. So you would prefer that for all uh, remodels, replacements, and new structures, we defer to federal and state? I think you have to do that anyways. Yeah, we're, we're going backwards here, and it's, it's, it's in a way which is very disturbing. We had this discussion for probably over an hour when we actually, and by the way, it wasn't my motion, it was Elle's motion, which I was happy to second when we put this back in. Um, th this, was, this was a decision where we made after, and which you voted against, Mike, back then, and Jane, you actually voted for it, where we decided that we would not have a situation where we as a city council completely said, okay, we wash our hands of the situation, we are willing to completely entrust the health of the environment 
to the city, to the state and federal governments. Because that's not what we're elected to do. And let me finish, Mike. You know, we had this exact same discussion. Because that, our job is to protect the people of this island. And there is a balance. And everyone who's spoken here tonight has talked about property rights, but every one of them, I would guess also, believes that in exercising their property rights, they protect the environment. And they value the environment, and that's why they live on the waterfront. And they would be extremely upset if their neighbor didn't do the same thing. But, you know, I hate to say it, but that happens all the time on this island. And it's, it may not be your neighbor this time, but it may very well be your neighbor next time who's going to do something on his or her property which you're going to find extremely offensive. And it's the job of this council to make sure that what happens not only on your property, but on the property next door to you, on the property down the road, is addressed in a responsible manner. And that's all we're up here to do. These standards are to say that it doesn't make any sense at all that we have one standard for a new dock, but if we're going to replace a dock, if we're going to replace 99% of a dock, then a completely set, different set of standards applies. And that's what you're saying is sufficient. And the only reason it's sufficient for you, Mike, is because you're willing to put your faith in the federal government, God knows why, and in the, in the state government, which has no money. So, I, I mean, I, it just, it escapes me completely what your logic is here. No, this is my logic. Yeah. This is my logic. We are pointing out the obvious. I mean, why don't we also add a, a FG, why don't we had a paragraph G there? And homeowners will not dump trash in Lake Washington. It's common sense type stuff that we don't do this, uh, this creosite and, and all the other things that you've got here. It's, it's basic knowledge and it's been accepted practice for a generation plus. Okay. I, you know, I'm gonna. Well, one one thing I I want to let me let me talk a little bit. I I always when this came in, I thought this was a restatement, and I questioned the purpose of even putting into this. So, actually, I'm supporting what Mike's saying to do this. Um, and the one thing that I've lived on the island 40 years now, uh, and I've been on the council 10. Um, I'm not aware of all the Hatfield McCoy activity on the waterfront with homeowners doing horrible things to each other. I would have heard about it by now. I haven't heard it. Um, and so I'm, I'm not buying that argument. Um, so anyway, um, I, I just think if this is restating, again, what people are going to have to do anyway through ecology and the Corps of Engineers, I never understood the purpose of putting this in there in the first place. So actually, um, I'm supportive of what you're putting forward, Mike. Well, Tim, a clarification here, because there seems to be a presumption that every dock replacement, remodel, or a new structure is going to somehow have a nexus with the core and the state. Can you clarify that and explain at what point does the core and the state become involved in those projects? Well, I'd want to um, I'd want to look at both federal and state regulations for the applicability before I give definitive answer. But most permits, most activity over the water require a permit from both. Your Mike would probably, Sarah would probably know better than I in terms of what they require. So knowing that, um, there are some that do not. And so the ones that do not, what standards apply to those? Well, again, I, I want to research that uh, more thoroughly before giving you an answer. Yeah, because you can see, you can see the problem here is that, that having that presumption that somehow everyone knows that you're not supposed to put copper-treated pilings in the water or creosote is not accurate because, you know, there are many projects that I've seen where they, in fact, propose to do that. Um, so really? Th yes, and so there are a number of loopholes in this document that need to be clarified, specifically the requirements for pilings, percent um, tra uh, translucency for the overwater structures, you know, all of the things that we've hashed around here. So uh, again, thinking that somehow this is common knowledge and that people are going to know what to do is not 
an accurate statement because there are many that do not. And the, the purpose of my comments, and I think you know Dan's as well, has been we, we need to clarify what we're asking those homeowners to do so that, one, they have certainty in getting a permit and that the time is reduced and they know what the end product is. And right now, I don't think we're there. All right, we have a, a motion or amendment forward, and, and uh, that's to delete section 5, all uh, A through F. Are there any comments on that amendment? Yeah, I, I'd like to say that it, it's become very clear through this discussion that we've, um, we have reopened one of the difficult conversations in this whole um, process that we've been going through. And that there is not consensus on the council as to where we're going. And it seems to me that at the end of that, uh, just leaving this language as is may be about the best we can do at this point. And so I would uh, vote against this amendment and suggest we just leave this alone and move on. Any other comments on the, the amendment? Well, I mean, I, uh, I agree with Bruce at this point. Uh, I thought this had been decided. We uh, voted this in last meeting and the meeting before and it seemed to make sense and uh, why are we revisiting it now we started out just making a small change or to and and the only issue was dealing at uh, making clear that uh, only a applies to the decking and then it uh, the discussion kind of devolved into all the other proposals and eliminating the whole thing and so on so I think uh, let's let's leave it alone as Bruce is suggesting and move on Okay, any other comments? Okay, uh, let's vote on the amendment. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Okay, it fails. So that was a 4-3. 3-4, three. Three, four. Three, four, rather, fails. Um, is there another motion for amendment? Or if we not, we're, we're defaulting back to leaving the language as is. Does anyone have a motion or amendment? Okay, seeing none, any other amendments on the main motion? Okay. You know, I, I, the, the, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, the, 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 I wasn't at the meeting where this was decided, and I, I raised it afterwards, and was it was decided to put it off to this meeting and it, it may go nowhere but the, the one thing that and the pictures of Mike show the pictures that the Tim had showed before of the of the vegetation on the shoreline um, now I, I mean I let me frame this in a very simple way is is that the way I, I see this that the, the debate seems to be whether one should have grass which goes all the way down to the shoreline or one should break that up with a vegetative buffer for all the reasons that have been talked about um, and the, as I understand the science of this thing the, the whole theory is that you're trying to get the runoff from the grass which can be roundup which can be fertilizers whatever to be to effectively be kept out of the lake to some extent through the vegetative buffer do you have a, a, is there a specific amendment and then we can discuss it what do you yeah I, what what the amendment would be that the on page 22 um, that the First, where it says 25% of the area shall contain vegetative coverage, I would change that to 50%. Um, could I jump in here and point you to page 26, which in uh, under D and number one establish the language to support that graphic? I'm sorry, I wasn't looking at the graphic. I was looking at the text then. Yeah, the, 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 the language 26 uh, D shows the illustration and then it just defines what those things are. So that you, 
you, you couldn't just change the figure. No, it's um, page 26, exhibit two. There's no, no graphic on that page. That's correct. All right. okay. So you, Going if back. you're going to amend the graphic, you also have to oh, amend gotcha. the language. So I just want to make you aware of that as you go down this. Yeah, okay. I, I'm sorry, Tim. I, I was just, I understand what you're saying. I, I was, I was just referring to in the text above figure C, it says 25% of the area shall contain vegetation coverage. Yes, and that is uh, also in the words on page 26. So I just, I wanted to point that out. So okay. as you're amending the figure, you're also going to have right. to Right, so be, okay, so you're saying 50% there and 50% also on page 26 in D sub I. So the motion would be to change it to 50% in both places. And in the graphic. Second. Well, I, I guess I got one question. Um, and does this apply to uh, existing improvements, existing veg, uh, lawns, or the, this yeah. would be triggered when there, when those events that trigger landscaping <coughs> come into play? When, when so stuff it would be development. When new, you new development over 500 square feet of additional gross mm -hmm. square uh, floor area or impervious surfaces mm -hmm. shall require this set of improvements well um i'm still i guess this old, old school. that was the wait a minute do we have a second on this yet yes. okay okay thanks all right the old school and in my book lawns are not evil and lawns uh, uh i don't think it should be encouraged or discouraged uh and i'm um, Afraid that uh, one of these triggers here would say, "Oh, you got to take your lawn out," and uh, I don't think we want to go there. Yeah. So I'm not going to support that uh, amendment. <coughs> well, maybe just, right. maybe just to clarify a couple things. So the the need for the vegetation in that strip is really twofold. One is to provide a filter between what's running off the lawn because the lawn is somewhat pervious but not completely. And as you put various herbicides, pesticides on that, they're going to run off. Those contain toxins, particularly uh, metals like copper. They'll end up in Lake Washington. So you've got a buffer there. So when you look at that picture up there, you got a vegetative buffer that will help to filter those toxins before they get in the lake. <coughs> Secondly, as those native plants grow, they're going to attract insects and invertebrates, and they, they're a food source for the fish that live, breathe, and hang out in that particular area. So a lot of people have kind of confused the issue of shading. And quite frankly, the, the main reason to have vegetation in that strip is to prevent toxins from entering the waterway and to provide home and habitat for insects that in turn provide food for the Chinook and Steelhead and other fish that migrate or spawn in that particular area. So there's a really good reason for that. So this looks like we'll get rid of the hardscaping um, Tim, is that what happens with the 50% rule in practice? No, it's, it's a vegetation no, buffer. It, it's it, just, it's the, all I'm talking about, Mike, is they, what you see that buffer that goes along the shoreline? So the grass is fine above it. It's just, it's just the, so the grass doesn't come all the way down to the shoreline. So you, it's just, it's, the lawn is, it, no one's talking about ripping up whole lawns. It's just trying to create what is a effectively you know, a, a, a vegetative buffer there. And you know, I, I fully understand that this is going to be a much harder sell, but it is, it is, you know, we keep looking at these pictures as to what we're trying to accomplish. Well, that's, that's where I want to interrupt right there, what we're trying to accomplish. When you say we, let's, let's, that's what you're trying to accomplish, right, okay? Sure. So let's keep that clear. Because one of the issues I have with going that direction with these softscapes is what happens to a high intensity place that we have with wave action with softscapes? It all goes into the into the lake. Well, that's fine if you're the city with the resources of the tax funds and, and you can you can softscape Luther Burbank and then in ten years repair what's eroded out. And that's what that's what that's what you're leading to. Um, but but um, I'll direct you to to the NOAA site with these with these living shorelines they are not appropriate for all situations drawbacks for living shorelines include not appropriate for high energy environments and I would I would table that 
that uh, Lake Washington is a high energy environment and will always be a high energy environment with the weather and the uh, boat traffic that we have. And you, and you, um, my worry is that when you put this type of code in here, you make it more difficult for bulkheads on 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 uh, properties, and you're going to force folks to put things in like this, which in quick order will erode away. Any more comments on the amendment, Bruce? I just want to, Tim. Does the does this language um, push somebody away from having a bulkhead? Um, no. This language would um, impact mortgage facilities, newer expanded mortgage, mortgage facilities, and any landward development over 500 square feet okay. would require this, uh, this standard. All right. And um, looking at the picture you've got up there, uh, up here, what uh, percent native vegetation did we end up with? Would you well when we look estimate at, in that? Yeah, we looked we looked at this uh, plan, and what this shows is the um, designer's um, um, view of what these plants will look like at maturity, and um, staff looks at it, and basically we're looking at a hundred percent for the shoreline area. Um, so in this case, you can see that, that the coverage is less than 100%, which is OK, because these plants will eventually grow out. So when we're talking about the coverage, we're talking about the mature coverage uh, after the plants have filled out. But if, if a landscape plan came in for your review depicting that, you would grade it at 100% of that yeah that's that correct buffer zone. Okay. so this is that, this this so it's a good benchmark here for the council to, right. to look at what 50 percent 25 percent or 100 percent looks like this is 100 percent yeah and you can see the 100 percent up here where all of these things will mature out this whole thing is um, fully planted these things are going to pop out so this is what 100 percent looks like at planting okay comments on the amendment well i just w which numbers change is two places uh what are we talking about, change? I can read it off too if you'd like. So under uh, 22 triple triple I A. Yeah, the first 25% mm -hmm. change to 50%, and the same on page 26. Just the first one. Just the first 25%. And then on 26. And D sub I, the 25% changes to 50%. Tim, what was the discussion with the Planning Commission on on this, on why 25% versus 50% or 75% or well, 100%? This, this was, um, and as uh, you heard at one of the earlier presentations, this was really a balance between uh, folks who wanted to increase the vegetative cover and those who wanted to eliminate it completely. Planning Commission chose the... Uh, 25% within the 20 feet uh, closest to the water as a midpoint and concluded that that was a fair and reasonable place to be. Um, uh, and that, that was where they settled after a long, long debate. Okay, so it's being, what is it now? What is it, what is the regulation now? Uh, I don't think we've, Okay, so we're uh, already, with this regulation the way it is now, we are ratcheting it up from, let's say, 0% to 25%. Correct. And so yes. what now, what the amendment that uh, Councilmember Grouse has is to ratchet up even further from 25% to 50%? Well, I wouldn't use the word ratchet, but it would double it. it it's common. <laughs> Everybody understands <laughs> well what it means. <laughs> Okay, you want to speak to the amendment? I, I'm going to speak to it real quick. Um, having on our slow boat ride around the island and looking at everything, um, I am comfortable with 25%. I think that that would be uh, a pretty good thing to get to that. And uh, I don't think that that's overly onerous on the property owners. And we actually saw different uh, homes that uh, Tim pointed out what 25% looks like. 
and I think it actually looks pretty good and it accomplishes you know the goal. So I would stick with the recommendation of 25 percent. Mike? Well, I disagree completely because 25% um, is not even close to the minimum. And it's ironic that we've got a slide up here which shows what the federal and state agencies required of the city in order to comply with an SMP-like project. And what we're saying is uh, for the, all the taxpayers to finance that project with 100% coverage, that's what we want. But when it comes to an individual who lives on the water, we're going to only require 25% of that. Somehow that just doesn't seem to be very fair. For fair to who? Please uh, see an order. Thank you. Um, anyone else would like to speak on the amendment? Uh, well, uh, I'm pretty uh, sure that or maybe Tim can help me on this, but th that the state wanted higher than 25 the, percent. The the state starting point is um, this may very well be. be one of the items that is discussed right. um, as we get further down the road. So we leave this alone, and we we may well be talking about this again. That would be a high probability. Yes, and I I, I hear um, you know the the concern. Uh, that, that this may place some burden on the public. Um, I, I too took the, the boat ride with Jim. I don't, um, as opposed to some of the other things we're talking about that have a lot of money associated with them, I think one of the, one of the nice things about this is that it doesn't cost much to put in plants. And uh, having done a lot of it myself, I, I know that you, you don't rack up the bills doing that. It's, it's a fairly easy thing to do. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't uh, uh, complicate one's life, in, in way, and especially some of the homes we saw that uh, had done it, it really ended up with a nice result. So, mm -hmm. um, I and mean, looking and looking at this, I can see you know something that it ends up being a nice result too. Uh, however, on this, I I, I I don't think we get there right now. I think we end up. Uh, getting there uh, potentially after the state looks at this, and, and so at this point, I'm I'm inclined to just defer to the uh, the planning commission on this and let it come back, and we'll talk about it when we've uh, got it forced upon us. Since I don't think we're there tonight. Any other comments? Okay, seeing none. All those in favor of the amendment to change it from 25 to 50 percent, say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Nay. Okay, that fails. Any? I'm sorry. Um, you can see there is a question of, of uh, voting on that. That's for the record anyway. Uh, I believe it was a 5-2. Is that correct? 2-5. Two 2-5, five. Two five, rather. It failed. So um, it, it's on the record, sir. It'll be. No. Well, you can, you can actually see it. Yeah, Councilmember Grass and Councilmember Grady voted for it. In the okay. Motion. Right. Any. Um, any other proposed amendments? Yes. Seen, uh, yeah. Yes, Go Mr. Ahead. Mayor. I'd like, yes, I would like to make an amendment. I would like to um, propose that all of the development standards for new remodel and replacement comport with the section that we've crafted for new docks. So sections where we've outlined uh, remodel or fit left less than 50% or greater than 50%, we delete those. And we have one single development standard that applies to new, uh, replaced, and remodeled. Those in turn would then comport with federal and state requirements and would certainly pass the muster of a, an ecology review of the SMP. Do we have a second? Okay, Mike, you speak to? I will. Uh, having worked uh, very closely with the Department of Ecology over the years on this issue, uh, the concerns that have been expressed tonight have not been resolved, and they focus really on the need for clarifications around four key areas. One is the shading issue, which there seems to be some misunderstanding that um, 
over water shading and vegetative shading are one and the same and I think we, we've addressed that earlier in talking about the need for uh, invertebrate and other insect uh, production along the shoreline. The hardened shoreline issue, this is again a great slide because um, there have been a, a lot of studies, a lot of projects in the region which have addressed the issue of uh, high energy, particularly from boat traffic. And if you zoom in on this and some of the other work we've done at Luther Burbank, you'll note that uh, embedded within the shoreline are large woody debris which act as a natural uh, hardened structure to help reduce the wave action and reduce the erosion along the shoreline. You also note on this slide too the need for gravel. The reason that's there is not just aesthetic, but what we're trying to do is provide some form of spawning habitat within that particular reach, which is critical for both the Chinook and Steelhead, not to mention some of the other uh, species that are of concern with the Muckleshoot Indian tribe. Uh, the problem we have with the increased hardening along the shoreline is it reduces the ability to have vegetation along the shore, reduces sediment input in, into uh, Lake Washington. We've talked about the vegetative strip issue. The other issue too that um, I'd like to raise is the, the issue of uh, pollutants into the waterways uh, and not only having the vegetative strip there but also finding ways to reduce uh, stormwater outfalls and treatment of stormwater into Lake Washington. Um, I'll pass around in a little bit a recent study that's been done on pre spawn mortality uh, based on urban stormwater. So I think in summary by having a development standard that is very clear it's consistent with federal and state requirements, um, does a number of things. But one in particular for the homeowner is it gives you certainty right up front what the requirements are. It will also allow streamlining of the permitting because the requirements by the city will be identical to those of the state and federal government. That's going to save time and money again for the homeowner. So uh, realizing that not unlike enhanced building codes. When I go to add uh, a room to my home, I build it to the current building code. Uh, I don't have different codes for uh, parts of the home. I don't have different codes based on when it's done. It's based on what the existing state building code standards are. And they're done for a reason. And they're quid pro quos for the public for building um, my structure or anyone else's structure to the current building code. So. I think, you know, not unlike building a new house, uh, if we're building a new structure along the shoreline, we should have uh, codes and requirements that are consistent with not only state but also federal requirements and, and streamline them to the extent that we can so it makes it easier for the homeowners uh, to get some certainty on what's required and get the permit in a, in a very timely manner. So that's my rationale for doing that. Thank you. Okay, comments on the amendment? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. Nay. Okay, that fails. Anyone else have a proposed amendment? Seeing no more proposed amendments, we're back to the main motion. And do we, we were successful, were any of the amendments successful? None. So it is as originally uh, put forward. Do we have any discussion on it? Well, the, the, with the yeah. with staff going back and with fixing the caveat, it. right, right. And you want that, uh, Dan? Do you want that caveat stated again? It's in the record. It's been it's, on, it's the on the record. Okay. All right. Any more discussion? Okay. Seeing none. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay. It it passes. Five two. Five two. All right, so that ends our regular business, and we go on to council member absences. Any absences coming up? Okay, seeing none, planning schedule. Uh, we are council the rest, uh, we don't have a meeting the rest of this month, and so the next time we will see each other will be September 6th. Um, any comments on the planning? I, Mr. Mayor, I do. Uh, on the September 6th with the EV infrastructure, I'm sure Councilmember Grady is going to have a few comments on that. So that, I doubt if that's going to make it through the c consent calendar. It, it's purely a 
it's an administrative contracting issue. If, if uh, okay. If Councilmember Grady has some questions in advance, we have be happy to answer them. But it's a pack agenda. You start pulling stuff off consent, you're going to be here late. Well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, I, I don't. If it's going to come off, then let's plan on it coming off. I don't plan on taking it off. Okay. Uh, my main interest is in moving it. Moving it forward, yeah, right. this, and that's what this is about. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> Unless you want to stall it out. Huh? I have no plans. Okay. And right. I have a question on November 7th, weighing the costs of government against the benefits. That, that's got a kind of a, what is, what is that? That's this. That's a presentation that we had scheduled for your planning session in June, but um, we just started running out of time, so I asked Chip just to pull it. It's, it's a presentation that largely Chip put together, but I, I – also had a hand in it, and it's trying to step back from the city's sort of nitty-gritty finances to a bigger picture and, and, and set a context. Um, and we thought if we did it right around the time we do the mid-biennial budget review, uh, put a bigger picture to the city's finances, then it'll get you thinking and maybe we can have a uh, more in-depth discussion at the January planning session. So is this a discussion of priorities of government or taxing or pros well, and cons it, and that's where I'm I'm hoping it um, it's on it, the it's technical part versus the philosophy of nah not so much that it's to it, we chips assembled a lot of data to at least demonstrate the the value that Mercer Islanders get for their existing tax dollars um, and the efficiencies when we compare ourselves to others that we have in place now um, so is this a dashboard report? Basically? Yeah, but it's got a little more of a, a little less about service, a little more about dollars and cents, uh, taxes and spending. Uh, this is, you know, in a lot of ways, this isn't unlike what you're hearing in the debates at the state level and the federal level. Right now, everybody's talking about where are we in this discussion of, of public service and how to pay for it. And it's a good... I think it's a worthy presentation just to step back, let him present it, and see if there's any more discussion from there. Very impartial presentation. It is so impartial. I mean, I'm sure you'll keep it that way. <laughs> yeah, it is so sanitized. You just <laughs> it's scrub. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hey, st uh, Jim, stepping down. Yeah. Just stepping down <laughs> to the next. <laughs> Okay. Still looking at November 7, looking right. at the first item of regular business, you've got to make it a house ordinance discussion. Okay. And it seems to me that the word discussion is there because it begs to be a study session topic rather than a regular business topic. Or is Do you really want it as regular business, Tim, oh, rather right. than as a study session topic? Oh, yeah. Mega. Sorry, this, yeah, you don't have the, the house, this housing scale discussion. You know, I, I probably put it there more than Tim did. Um, to the extent that you know, it's a we got a study session already scheduled that night. Uh, yeah, I agree. It doesn't it doesn't fit in that respect? But I but I some, I pause at the thought of us actually trying to to take it on as an agenda bill when I have no idea where we're going with to, that to, right to now. To us. And, to us, it does the difference between a study session hour and it, an informational discussion of a, on an agenda item. Really, there's not much of a difference. Uh, what it comes down to is what's the recommended action, and in this case, it'll be council. Do you want to go any further with this? Um, so, uh, if we do it as an agenda item, regular business to us, it doesn't make that much difference. If it does to you, we'll. I, I, my, my own personal opinion, uh, one seventh of the council would be that it'd be a study session item rather than a regular business item at this stage. Whilst we're trying to figure out where we want to go with it. Um, well, we, you know, we could November twenty first. We could do that. We could just move it um, to that next agenda. Yeah. How does the council feel on that? Is that more of a study session? Okay, I'm I seeing. like it as a study session. Okay, yeah. I'm hearing. So we'll try to figure out a We'll do that. I'll, we'll study rearrange session. this and, and rebalance it. Okay. <laughs> On okay. the boat, too. You will take down. <laughs> okay, any other planning schedule? Okay. Uh, not from months. Nothing. Okay, no. board appointments. There are none. Council reports. Start over with Jane. Anything? Okay, Dan? No. Okay, L. Yeah, um... 
Jane, Mike Grady, Mike Cero, and I uh, attended the Washington Policy Center uh, luncheon mm -hmm. where we heard a fellow named Patrick Moore uh, speak about the role of science in environmental policy making. And Dr. Patrick Moore is uh, actually, uh, his latest book is, he's the author of uh, Confessions of a Greenpeace Dropout. So it was a fascinating talk. Uh, I'd love to hear what um, my colleagues thought of it. And uh, I'm sure you'll tell me offline uh, what you thought of that. Um, but uh, it, was, it was a good experience. I could give you a preview. I, the only part I agreed with was the part about saving the whales. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a great presentation and uh, very informative to me. Also for what we're doing here on the SMP, because the first uh, part of it, first couple hours actually uh, uh, referenced uh, quite a few communities going through the same thing that we are going through and, and gave me some, some uh, interesting information and data uh, that either used here directly or anecdotally. Right, Grady? Uh, Bruce? I just say thanks for covering for me while I had a nice vacation. I have no other report than that. Uh, two <laughs> things. Uh, one, we had a YRA 8 meeting last week, at which point we um, uh, Sorry. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Just want to make sure you got this. Um, so last week we had, or the week before last, we had a YRA meeting, our watershed, uh, of all of the elected officials, and decided on grant allocations for state and federal funding. Uh, we didn't have any in the queue that I was aware of, uh, but uh, we may want to start putting a list together for 2012 funding uh, to see if, to what extent we can get those funded. That we would just be did get some. $225,000 grant contract from the state on um, stormwater LID project. Good. That's good. Okay. Uh, the last thing I'll mention uh, with the EV stuff, uh, we've got a regional workshop coming up in Everett, uh, Snohomish County, um, Snowpud, Snohomish PUD, and the Navy, uh, along with a lot of private industry are going to sponsor this event, and it'll be an update on where we are with deployment of all the EV charging stations in the region, um, who's got electric vehicles, uh, the state deployment of the green highways on I-5, I-90, and US-2, and we'll have most of the delegation there along with most of the administrators from both state and federal agencies. So it should be good. I've now been passed by two Nissan Leafs. Um, it's very embarrassing driving a Ford and getting passed by a Nissan Leaf. Okay. Comes out with the next week. okay, Bruce. Did you bring your slideshow? No. Okay. PowerPoint. Uh, PowerPoint. Okay. We had our joint. Uh, well, we had the um, uh, superintendent, city manager, uh, school uh, board president, and mayor's meeting this morning, um, and basically looking at a little bit of the work that Dan did um, with the pool and kind of the status of that. Also, a few little options coming forward and how we ought to bring them to the council and school board to discuss. With that, the ad hoc committee uh, will be coming together either August 29 and 30. So, Bruce, you know that one? Bruce, okay. Bruce and and Al. Availability on those two mornings, right. 7 30, those two mornings. And then we're looking at a joint city council uh, school board meeting, it'll be October 10th probably 6 to 8 p.m. and that'll be facilitated. I sent that email out to you a couple weeks ago. I've heard back from Mike, Mike Grady. Um, and so I'm assuming if I don't hear anything, you can make it. Okay. If you sent it out, I responded. I didn't not respond. I remember. You might want to reset. I'll reset. Re reset. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, six to eight. Council, can I please ask you to speak in your microphones because you I'm are sorry. still being recorded. Okay, October 10th from six to eight, we're looking at the joint city council school board meeting. And as I said, that will be facilitated. It's Monday night on one of our off Mondays. And that's at the school district? I think I got that email. Mm -hmm. I think we said school district, I don't remember. And one thing that I did 
catch. I went and I went up to um, the city of Mukilteo and the mayor and I went around to look at different things. And one of the takeaways, and maybe uh, Mike Grady, this would maybe you'd know this. They had um, a grant where they got money to get almost enameled things that, with salmon on them that they then glued in front of all the water, storm waters. And there was grant money, and I thought it was really slick and beautiful. And I was thinking that maybe that's something this city ought to try to find them and get the money to do because uh, we've just used paint, and that's gone now. And, and these are really high quality, good looking things. So I would just put that forward as a good takeaway. Um, with that, I don't have anything else. We're off, and so we won't see each other until September. So with that, have fun and uh, I guess uh, summer outfits are maybe the first meeting in September then we got to go back to ties right yeah. Mike <laughs> <laughs> so. Council, uh, that first meeting in September um, Glenn's going to sit in for me uh, April and I are have delayed and canceled rescheduled a trip to France three different times um, but we're we're going first two weeks of September so au revoir is that correct, Jane? Perfect, yes. Right. <laughs> okay, with that, we are adjourned. Thank you all.